have more, guys. But I'm laying it out today before you go. Little yeah. baggy. So best thing if you want if you want to write it down, let's say if you want to feed it tonight at eight. Okay, or you start tonight at eight, 50 grams flour and 50 grams of water and just a tiny pinch of instant yeast. Okay. And then. So that's what you guys took home, right? Yeah. And then tomorrow morning. So then Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. You add 50 grams of flour and 50 grams of water. So that's only because like you, you didn't start yours, right? So then at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, you add 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water. So, and then you're back on course, okay? Yep. Yeah, it's in your recipe too. Yeah. You start with 50 grams each, then you add 50 grams each. Yeah. So it's it's always ends up being equal equal portions. It should be, but is it? Yeah, 50 grams, 50 grams, then 50 grams, 50 grams, then 100 and 100. Then here it says remove 20%. But what's missing is you have to replace that 20%. So that's when you're taking 20% is 80 grams because this total is, is 400, right? Um, and so 20% is 80 grams. And so then you're adding 40 grams of water and 40 grams of flour to replace what you removed. And then on day five is when you can make your bread. Since your day five should be Thursday is when you're making the dough so you can retard it overnight and bake it on Friday. It only sounds if you do it once, you know how to do it again. If you do it once, you do it right. You never have to do it again. Now, when what happens? Okay, here's here's the reality. Before I introduce myself, but here's the reality of what Steph Donald is saying: You do it once, and you're addicted, yeah. and you're going to do it over and over again, and try many, many different methods, right? Yeah. And you and you start to get involved in in sourdough artisan bread groups, and everybody is arguing whether. It's a six hour and a 12 hour or a one to one or a two to one or a three to one or a, and there are a plethora of methods. What we are trying to do with the class is keep everybody on an even keel so that it's, it's easy for us to also, uh, or in this case, Chef Donald, to be able to grade you on your accomplishment, on, on how well you are developing that competency, right? Because if everybody does something different, then I really don't know is it your competency of the of the uh, um, process or the variation that you did that is the, the issue or the benefit or things like that? So that's why we try to do one standard method. Um, so to so you know, glad you could all make it now that we're kind of settled in. Um, yeah, sure, please do. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chef. We're very excited about this. Lots of group, uh, really enjoyed this. You get to sample some bread. Uh, Chef Mark, uh, he sort of serendipitously, serendipitously, mm -hmm. serendipity in the fact that 
we had a mutual friend that thought we knew each other, but we didn't. And I made a mistake. I remember it was another Mark LaRouche at the time. And I was thinking this was Mark LaRouche. I got like, oh, yeah. to James Paul. <laughs> so it was kind of a, a weird circle of how we met. So I got Mark involved and asked if he wanted to come to the market and play for a little bit. And people just are boarding to the market now for their for their pastry breakfast from uh, Lasagne, Stemming, Lasagne. Beautiful uh, 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 puff pastry. Um, well, the apple tart, man, it's like off the tart. It's good. It's like off the tart. Good. All kinds of good stuff. So we're very excited to have Mark. He's going to give you a little bit of this background here because it is so extensive. And uh, bombard him with the questions. He's the guy that answers these questions. And he's going to give you a couple of leads on websites and, and webinars that he does. So uh, write those down that you're. It's a, this is a great contact for you. This becomes part of your networking. Your network is so important in this business. Otherwise, we wouldn't be together doing this. If yeah. I wasn't networking, we wouldn't be together doing this. Mark would be uh, doing his thing somewhere else or someone else that he met uh, here yeah. on the island, and I would have missed out. So I'd be feeding the neighborhood. That's right. You'd be feeding the neighborhood. Mark loves to bake. Because I just love to bake. It's really, it's... Uh, it's something that with, with culinary and with baking, it's, it's something that gets into your blood and it's just, you know, it, it's something you do with a passion. Um, and um, I, I wish one of these days I'm going to write down the uh, Thomas Keller's phrase and be able to remember it all. But in the end, what Thomas Keller is always saying is that the reason we do all of this, the reason we try to make good food is to make people happy. And that, that is in the end. And, and like when, when we have people at the market, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> when we have people coming at the market and telling us how great the pastries are, or we've actually had a couple of uh, people who have come and said, you know, the last time I've ever had pastry like this was when I was in Paris, France, right? Um, and so those are things we've made these people happy and that makes us happy, right? Um, and, and I enjoy doing it as a volunteer at the, the uh, Cape Breton market. Um, to be able to help the market as another way of generating income. Um, I just get reimbursed for the ingredient cost and I, I do everything, all of it just out of joy and, and, and enjoy. And of course, I eat one or two myself sometimes, right? You know, not that you can tell, right? Um, and, uh, and he gets to work with uh, chefs as well, which is kind of yep. fun. <laughs> it's always kind of fun. We always have fun, yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, and so the common the common friend that uh, Chef Donald and I have is uh, um, a friend who worked at the Celtic Lodge, and um, I was the executive pastry chef at the Celtic Lodge in 1983 and 84, um, and Donald was there a couple of years after me, but we actually had never met until just recently. I, I fell in love with Cape Breton in the 80s when I worked there and always wanted to come back and retire. I took an early retirement um, package buyout from the company I worked for in 2019, and we decided to come here to Cape Breton, and have loved it ever since. We we live in. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I started off 45 years ago. Right. Um, I was two and a half. <laughs> um, so yeah, I um, uh, long story short, my family moved to Germany. Uh, I'm originally from Toronto. Uh, and I was always young when we moved to Germany and I did um, all my schooling and I did an apprenticeship as a confectioner, pastry chef, uh, ice cream maker, and all these things is what they call a condito. Uh, it's three and a half years of working in a pastry shop and going to school one day a week at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so it's one full day of school from 7 a.m. till 4 p.m. And then the rest of the week uh, just working like from 4 a.m. till noon, two o'clock type of thing, right? Um, and then on Saturdays, we had the good fortune. We got to come in Friday night at 10 and work all night long and until about nine or 10 the next morning. Right? Um, and so um, from there, I've, I've worked in a variety of different places. I've been very fortunate um, that in the beginning, uh, my adventurous side of changing jobs was, was difficult because it was good for me that I learned but then you reach a certain point where it's sometimes hard to get a good job because you, I was changing jobs so much that it was hard to get people to take a chance on me because they were kind of like, well, are you just going to stay six months or a year and leave again? And it's like, well, it all depends on how good you treat me. right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, um, 
I, I worked in I worked in uh, a, a chain of, of bakeries like a, a that did satellite like a small wholesale type setup, a convention center, uh, a global restaurant chain. I worked at the Royal York Hotel in Toronto, the Windsor Arms Hotel in Toronto, the pastry shops, cafes, a kosher style fine dining restaurant, uh, all kinds of things like that. Um, and oh, it was huge. Um, in the thousands, uh, my uh, no, I think it's about three or four. It might be the max, right? Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, we did one big party for the where I got to make dessert for the the mother of Queen Elizabeth, um, and I, I wasn't the only one. Okay, there was fourteen of us on the team, but that was my my claim to fame uh, was at that first. I was, uh, we made strawberries Romanoff for two thousand people. Um, so that was, uh, it took us actually more than two days to prepare all of that because the strawberries all have to be cleaned and cut and you have to cook the sauce and everything and then assemble it all, right? Um, so the assembly is all on the last day uh, with the ice cream, the strawberries, whipped cream and the chocolate shavings on top. And uh, it's just bang, 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 right? Um, and, uh, but it was a lot of fun, a lot of interesting times. Um, and uh, I also did, the biggest one I ever did was for, there's a, um, in Germany, as hunting subsided because of population density, what they have is, is shooting clubs uh, where people uh, do target shooting and they, they crown king and queen. And it was the 500th anniversary of this uh, club. And, um, <clears throat> and so they did this big banquet and everything. And I found out also that was an interesting time as I found out how powerful citric acid is. And um, in that uh, kiwi fruit is very high in citric acid, right? And you think of citric acid as something just sour, you know? But also when you hear of the word acid, if you think in terms of James Bond or something like that, acid can be corrosive, right? And so can citric acid in concentrated levels or continued exposure. We were making a dessert for 5,000 people for this celebration. And this dessert was a parfait with um, sliced fresh kiwi fruit on top. Um, this was, you know, the, the late 70s uh, when kiwi was just becoming very popular from down under and all that. And so the chef neglected to suggest that we wear gloves doing this. And we were peeling the kiwi and slicing it with our bare hands. Um, and then towards the end of the day, I was complaining of my hands hurting and then looked up and I was bleeding and I hadn't cut myself anywhere. I was actually, the, the acid had burned right through my skin, through the pores, uh, like through the fingerprints kind of, and was, was bleeding. And I went to a doctor and they were considered uh, second degree burns. And I had to be bandaged and I, I ended up being off work sick for three weeks till it healed, right? So um, it is, so it's, you know, it can be very dangerous as well. So, so yeah, so PPE, like wearing gloves is not only to protect your guests, it's also to protect yourself, right? So you should always be aware of that. It's just, that just, you know, they didn't get the benefit of that story this morning. That's only you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy, right? Um, and so, yeah, I've worked in a lot of different places. I'm, I got to come back to Canada through the global chain that I worked at in Germany, which is called Movenpick, a Swiss restaurant chain. They opened the first one in North America in Toronto. So through that is how I get, got to come home and worked a lot of different places. And then in 1994, um, I, um, and this is, speaks to networking now. Um, and uh, I got a call from a recruiter that uh, I was aware of the recruiting company because a friend of mine was, was dealing with them. And um, he called me up and, and said, you know, I'm from this and this company, okay. And he says, well, I was talking with Kate Nugent and she just said, I call you and I have this opportunity and would you be interested, right? And I said, yeah, I'll take a look at it. And it was for a technical support person for what was then Maple Leaf Mills, which is now owned by ADM, Archer Daniels Midland. So if you're interested in finding more about that company, it's one of the largest agro-processors in the world. It's, uh, the website is adm.com um, and they have, sales of approximately 74 billion per year. And they have about 35,000 employees. So I was, I got to be one of those 35,000 cogs in the wheel for 25 years. 
Um, so I, I started that job, ADM bought the company, I stuck with it. I did, as I said, I started off doing technical support, which meant I would go around to bakeries, primarily Ontario, but also Quebec, New Brunswick, uh, the Maritimes, Atlanta, Canada. I'd never been to PEI, but I've been like all over places here in Nova Scotia, or coins and Chetty Camp and everything and stuff too. Um, and basically either troubleshooting uh, situations or helping them with product development or demonstrating new products and, and new ideas to them and things like that. Uh, I did all the IGA store openings and, and uh, food cities and, and Sobe openings in Ontario and parts of New Brunswick as they were also changing over from scratch baking to using mixes for um, more consistent results in all of the bakeries and things, right? Um, and so from there, I, I did different things within the company. And I worked in the milling group for 14 years in, in Canada and Mississauga was where my home base was. And then I got an opportunity and I moved to the US to ADM's uh, Global Research Center. Um, and it's a, it's a large building uh, that used to be a big high school at one time. High schools in the US are massive, right? They're, they're really big buildings. And they've added on to this building in the meantime, many times yet. And uh, it's a beautiful, huge campus, a gigantic, nice, green front lawn, huge parking lot. Um, there's about 240 scientists working there. And then another 150 support staff and, and things from other like lawyers or patent lawyers or things like that and stuff, so on. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's half a floor of them is just patent lawyers. <laughs> It's an avenue that I never really thought of as available to culinary research development. Mm -hmm. You know, making these fast foods that are frozen, they can bring out of your mind. Someone is making these foods, someone is producing these recipes, you know, these grab and go, uh, you know, whether it's frozen or, or now freeze dry is the yep. thing. And uh, you can actually take freeze dry, I can make you a turkey dinner, I can freeze dry it, put it in my cupboard. 25 years later, that's true. 25 years later, add water, and you don't know that I didn't just make that turkey. Is that crazy? There's, there's, yeah. Is there? so, so, and yeah, so mentioning freeze drying, I mean, the, the equipment we had there, or that they still have, just that I'm not there anymore, right? Um, um, is, is just phenomenal. I mean, we have a small lab size freeze dryer. We can do small quantity freeze dry, small batches, especially of certain components or flavors or things like that. Or, you know, if we're doing some, they, they can freeze dry small amounts of things. Um, uh, we have uh, um, votation units to be able to make margarines, shortenings, and things like that uh, in a small hundred pound batches, right? Uh, rather than the thousands that it takes on a, on a big plant, right? Um, now, and you start off with a hundred pound batch, but you, you really only get a few tubs. You only get maybe 10 pounds out of it. And then the rest, you're just recirculating again, right? And this um, now is becoming in the forefront because yeah. you noticed last week, if you're watching the news, we had to unburn, so look for light. Numbers. Yeah. Uh, these journeys are going to start to begin. How do you feed these people? You're not taking 50 pounds of potatoes to make 50 pounds of well, yes, and there's a lot of there's a lot of debate about all of those things. I mean, the things that you don't see in sci-fi that are just so super interesting is where they're looking at also nutrition. So there's so many different avenues you can go from here that tie in where your skills are very important and complementary to the other skills, like food science, like we were saying, nutritionists, dietary nutrition. Um, they may understand a lot about the nutrients, but how to get them into the food and so that they're palatable and also so that you don't destroy the nutrients either, right? Um, and it's, it's important. So all the things, so that speaking of traveling to Mars, one of the problems with um, going into space is that our body is so smart. It's so good at adjusting. And that is you so long, what they did is they took twins uh, they, and I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but they took twins. One twin brother stayed, identical twins. So one twin brother stayed on Earth, and the other was a, was a trained astronaut. He was already a long time in the program, so it's not like they picked them overnight. They're both military background and everything. Um, and he went up into space for an extended period of time. I think it was a year or something like that. 
and then came back and then they measure all kinds of comparisons, right? And one of the big things that they notice is your bone density changes, okay? Because you're in weightlessness so long, your body says, well, I don't need these big bulky hard things. They can, they can be soft and stuff, it doesn't matter because now I don't have to hold up all the ugly bag of water anymore, right? You know, because it's, it's just these, these flippity flops can be there. So they've got to figure out nutrition to be able to keep that in balance so that your body will respond differently so that when you do return to earth or you go to a planet that does have gravity, that your body can, can deal with that, that you don't all of a sudden tap the table and you've got a broken hand, right? Um, things like that. So, but we're here to talk about bread. Um, and, and so I want to wrap up also talking about, uh, you know, RCA is another thing you want to look into, the Research Chef Association. And the website for that is colonology.org. So that's C-U-L-I, colon, N-O-L-O-G-Y, dot O-R-G. And so they've coined the term colonology. They've, they own it. And you can get certified as a culinary research chef, or you can get certified as a culinary scientist. So it's a certified culinary scientist, which is when you have a food science background and 80% of the questions are culinary and 20 are food science, or a culinary research chef is when you have a culinary degree and then 80% of the questions are food science and 20% are culinary. So there's an exam that has to be done and you also have to have years of um, uh, experience to, to before you can write the exam, right? Um, that go with that. Um, so those are very interesting things. And so, um, so yes, I got to work at ADM in Decatur, Illinois. I was there for 11 years. And uh, I, my title, I looked after, I was a senior bakery application scientist. So I looked after ingredient applications for bakery. Um, ADM produces about 350 uh, different ingredients, uh, not counting flavors. If you include the flavors, it's probably almost 700, something like that. Um, <clears throat> and um, so I would work with all of these different ingredients, whether it be doing research to try and see, for example, using lecithin and xanthan gums and other um, ingredients to replace monodiglycerides, or if it was product development in trying to create gluten-free cookies with beans and lentils and, and things like that, um, ingredients that we produced, right? So a lot of different things. And you can learn tons about ADM on their website. Um, so I worked in, I, I did product development, I did research and I did concept development as well. Concept development is where we created ideas for uh, customers or showed them at trade shows and things like that. Um, and or, you know, working with customers on, on ideas like uh, making a, um, uh, a, a bean, a black bean tortilla shell for Taco Bell, right? Um, that's uh, probably going to come in the market soon, right? Um, and so I worked a lot with them on that and in their plants running those and, and stuff. So really neat stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, we talked a little bit about the starter already, you know, kind of on the catch up. So the starter for the sour, the whole process is um, twofold, really. We're we're using, I suggested to, to Chef Donald that you put a little tiny pinch of yeast in in the beginning to help ensure that it actually really gets going because most of the flour that we buy today has um, been through the milling process and because of how long it's been sitting in the warehousing and things in the way it dries up and stuff, there's not a lot of wild live culture left on the flour. Um, so that's why just to help make sure that you can get it going it's just a tiny pinch of yeast that helps with that, right? Um, and, um, and so uh, what we're doing is, is we're really, we're building up, we're creating yeast by allowing it to ferment always that 24 hours, the, the yeast cells, they keep splitting. So you, you start off with, you know, a couple million, and then after 24 hours, that couple million has doubled. And then after another 24 hours, when you keep feeding it, they double again and they keep doubling. They actually double about every four hours approximately. Oh, sorry, I didn't pay attention. I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. That's not for you, don't worry at all. Yeah. And, um, 
And so, um, <clears throat> so we're feeding it to create yeast, to create that fermentation medium. So that it'll produce the gas and everything for us for proofing and all of that. Also what it does, and where sourdough of course gets its name, is it produces the sour flavor. So by doing these longer fermentations that we're doing in this particular recipe, long meaning 24 hours each time before we feed, we're going to produce lactic acid as well as acetic acid. So acetic is like vinegar, okay? And that's because of all the alcohol that's produced that starts to get converted into acetic acid. Just like if you let wine ferment too long, it turns to vinegar, right? Um, yeah. Same, same process, right? Um, and so, um, and so we're, we're trying to get that balance and get that going. To, to start, if it's, the pH drops too low, if you let it ferment too long before feeding it, then it, the yeast can't grow anymore. So it's just like any other bacteria is you think of, you know, sometimes as a kid, I used to imagine that we were all just bacteria on a little ball of something. That you know the planet Earth is not, yeah, and away we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, you know, we like bacteria want to be comfortable. You want to have a nice, comfortable temperature, like seventy-five to eighty is really nice and cozy, right? You know, seventy is still nice, right? Eighty gets a little warm. Over and up in the nineties, you start to slow down, right? We just like, uh, you know, it's manana man, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and we want to have water, we want to have something to drink, and we need to breathe, right? And we need food. So the bacteria, the yeast bacteria is the same way. So you, you treat it with respect in that sense of just th those basic understandings that it needs warmth, not too hot, not too cold, that, you know, like the Goldilocks thing, right? It needs water, it needs air, and it needs food, right? So the, the, um, the flour helps have a lot of the food that the flour that you add in the feed each time, those are complex carbohydrates. Now, the yeast can't just eat that flour all by itself, all right? Actually, the, the, our wheat flour is very, it, it's also very complex in that way. It contains various enzymes, like amylase enzymes and protease enzymes, and especially the amylase, or sometimes people will add, add malt, uh, like a malted barley or something like that, that is the enzyme that breaks down the starch that is in the flour, all these carbohydrates, complex starches, into simple sugars so that the yeast can consume it. Okay, the yeast can't consume the straight starch, right? So if you took yeast and cornstarch and mixed it together, it won't bubble, it won't work, right? Um, because there's no enzymes there to, to break it down, right? Um, so that's why gluten-free is very challenging, not just because you have the gluten missing, but also because you have to have those enzymes and most of the enzymes we get from a wheat-based process or a gluten-based process. So it, it gets very complicated there, right? Um, so that ferments over and over and gets nice and sour. And then we make up our dough and it, it's producing the flavors, producing the sour and it's producing the yeast for us. And we're gonna show you some of the, the different methods and, and stuff, so on. So it's gonna be kind of jumping back and forth because if I were going to do this, everything from start to finish and progression, we would have had to start on Sunday morning and we would be finished on Friday afternoon. <laughs> and I don't think you would care for that very much. Yeah. Um, but so um, going to see, you're going to get to see some of what they look like when they've already been through the proofing and, and rising a bit, right? So here, this is the, the ones that we prepared this morning. And normally you would let this retard and rise in the fridge overnight because it, it helps with more complex uh, flavor development. So right? to just take it down. You're cooling, you're, you're, so when you put it in the fridge, your temperature in your fridge is about four degrees Celsius. The fermentation does not stop, it just gets much slower, okay? So it's like if you, if you went outside to, to go for a walk, you know, you just, you need to burn more energy when it's cold out. So you just, or you just go, go slower because it's cold um, than when it's, when it's nice and warm. <clears throat> so, uh, let me just, yeah. 
Oops, no, wrong one. Great, thank you. And so we're going to see the rest of this process as we get to, but I just wanted before I miss these so we can get these in the oven and you can see these as they come out baked and we can compare them with uh, some of the others. Right? And so what I use, I like to use um, wheat hearts or wheatlets or farina um, underneath. Uh, a lot of recipes call for cornmeal. That works just fine. Um, my personal preference for the wheat hearts or wheatlets is because they are more readily available in Canada. And I find they're not as hard and as big and crunchy as cornmeal, right? Um, yeah, and this, so these ones are, this is, and this is the wheatlets that I buy. I'm cheap. That's my, my German background, I guess, right? It's kind of semi-Scottish almost, right? Yeah, yeah, and baker, yeah. Um, so this is cream of wheat. Cream of wheat. It's simply oh, yeah. cream of wheat. But if, if, but if you want the nice wheatlets that have no bran in it, you can buy them commercially. They are sold through food service distributors uh, and usually in 10 kilo bags, right? Um, and they're, they're, it's really nice, right? It's really, I, I really like that. I like the flavor of it as well. And so now we should be able to, if we did everything right, I should be able to just turn these out of the banneton. So, if, Stand up for a couple of minutes. Okay. If you if you find that you're not your concentration can't stand up for a couple of minutes, it's a little locked, maybe around the you'll see, but there we go. They're they're really nice if you want to do breads on any regular basis and like these types of rye breads or or these types of high hydration breads, um, because if I didn't rise them in the basket, they would just spread, keep spreading. Because of the, so, so much water, there's not enough st strength for the dough to hold it in shape. So can I um, one second? Yep. We talk about what the ingredients do. Some are dryers, some are levelers, some are for the toughness, some are for tenderness. So this, this is what he's talking about. Too much liquid, not enough dryer. And so I'm cutting in so that it will help rise there very gently. This is, yep, so slashing or, or also called scoring, right? So I did that with this type of a serrated knife. Um, also what you can use is a lame. Um, it's spelled lame, L-A-M-E, and it's really just a razor blade, right? Um, so, but putting it on this holder where it's curved gives you a little bit better control for cutting than just holding a plain razor blade. But I've been in, in plenty of bakeries, I'll tell you, there'll be a razor blade with just a little piece of tape on it sitting at the edge or, or stuck in a, in a wood jam or something, and the baker will just grab that and, and do his thing. And, and yep. yep. <laughs> And, and I, I know that, uh, I don't know if I put this video up, but I'll, I'll find it you where they do this in the early bread, they make it with the flour or the leaves. Or, there's a real skill set to doing these slashing. And it's kind of a, becoming of age uh, for this. Yeah, and the ones where they do a lot, a lot of the decorative stuff are not usually high hydration like this. They're, they're more of a 60% hydration. Um, and so you're familiar with Baker's percent, right? So when I say, say 60%, that means for every 100 pounds of flour, 60 pounds of water, right? Yes, that, so the hydration of that is 60%, you got a thousand. So it's a thousand grams of water you're using 600, a uh, thousand grams of flour you're using 600 grams of water, right? This is 80, this is actually 80, and some will go as high as 90 or 100. So you have a thousand grams of flour, 80% of that, on, in water, 1,000 flour and 800 grams of water on top of that. Yeah. 
and this is actually to be technically accurate, it's slightly higher than 80 because the, the sour is 100% hydration. So, but for argument's sake, it's an 80% hydration dose, right? And so the lame is, is like, this is a tool where you buy the razor blades that just, you can put on there and they just come off and you replace them. This is just the same, like the same kind of razor blade like your grandpa used to use to, to shave with, right? I'm sure, I doubt many of you are familiar with that anymore. There we go. And, or you could also buy them disposable. And I got this one for free with something, I think it was when I bought the baskets, right? And it comes with a little protective cover for it so you don't cut your fingers open. And this one has the little leather cover on it. Yeah. So preheating the oven at 450, then I'll bake it with lots of steam in the beginning and then drop it down. And in these ovens, I drop it down to 410. If I was baking at home, I would, I would drop it to 425, right? Um, so the temperature doesn't drop immediately when you turn the dial down, but that's where you want it to, to go to, to finish the baking process. And they take about 35 minutes. And as they are done, I'll show you how we check for doneness as well, right? Um, so both experience-wise and, and accurately scientific-wise. So you say you read that up and on, then turn it down, yeah. Yeah. Got to remember to put my mask on. There we go. Thank you. Oh, forgot to preheat this way. We'll leave it up at 450 for a bit. Let me give this a moment. To, I forgot to turn it back up earlier. Thank you. Yep, perfect. Let's just give it a moment to come up. Is there a way to tell what the temperature is? Oh yeah, I can see it now. It should okay. be on the probe too. Yeah, 429, 430, it's coming up. It doesn't take long. Let's give it a moment. Let's give it a moment. We'll get back to that in a second. So, um, So I'll pass these around. Um, now I, I have some that we made this morning. I have some that I, I prepared over the weekend and I'll talk about that in, in more detail. There's, there's slight differences there uh, with each, uh, but here are the, some of the starters. This is Alphonse. Can you spare any of that? Sure. Just a little on here because I know it's going to get the back view. I'm not sure. Yeah, let's give it a whiff. And that's Alphonse. And here's Bob. Alphonse and Bob. <laughs> if you name them, you care. Yeah. Right? Did everyone get their starter started? Everyone did? Same thing. Water has a specific gravity of one. One gram of water is one milliliter of milk and cream, not the heat. Not in the fridge yet. We want that yeast to uh, activate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, I want to make sure I have enough of Caroline first. Right? 
So yeah, and so this is Caroline. So this is your. Yeah. So th this is the same. So really, these are all the same strata, but but Caroline is is the age it should be. Right. These ones are are older. The other two, Alphonse and Bob, are each like uh, Bob is one day older than Caroline, and Alphonse is two days older than Caroline, um, and had had feedings in between. So you can see the sourness even changes a little bit you can keep the system continuously and keep it going um this, this, but it, in in the very beginning stages the first few days it changes after that it somewhat stabilizes it may change seasonally uh, depending on the you know the flower and the things in the air and stuff like that um but i have a friend in a friend of mine in toronto who has a great bakery a petite uh, tuet um and he uh he's originally from Alsace. And he actually went back home to Alsace when he started this bakery in Toronto and went to a bakery there that he knew from his childhood. And he got them to sell him a kilo of their starter to take home to Canada. It's 100 years old. Right? So there's nothing in it that's really 100 years old per se, but it's been going for 100 years. And it has a certain flavor and characteristic to it. Now, now often what happens with that um, is that when you change the region of where you're growing it, you don't have the same bacteria and the, the flavor changes. So it, in with sourdoughs, we're lucky that most of the bacteria we rely upon is, is from the flour, so we can uh, emulate most of that. But when it comes to things like curing meats and stuff like that, um, I, I know I did a visit in Italy and there's this one place that makes um, uh, prosciutto hams and stuff like that in, in Italy and they moved to a bigger facility, they had to disassemble the tiles from the old facility and bring it over to, that was the only way to transplant all the bacteria because otherwise they couldn't get it to taste the same. Yeah, um, so, it, so it's quite amazing, yes. Yeah. Um, so we are going to uh, prepare the, um, oh, let me get the big bowl here. Uh, yes, please. Yep. Yeah, put it in first. Slide it all the way in, yeah. And now we want to, first we want to hold the steam button for about 10, 20 seconds. No, the steam is to, well, it does help rise, not to be faster, but it does help it rise. But and what, how it does that is that the steam gelatinizes the surface starch on the crust, okay? So that it basically, it starts cooking it without drying it. So this allows it to still continue to extend before it starts drying and it extends better that way. It gives it more stretchability as well. Also then that's what helps produce that nice thin crust that you get that, that's nice and crisp is by using steam. So now we can turn the temperature down to 410. And we're gonna give it 35 minutes. So yeah, very good question. I was going to get to that. So, um, but yes, it, uh, it's, to, it's to help ensure that um, you get a nice crisp crust. So lean breads, we, um, we steam. So anything that is just salt flour water, 
low or no sugar, low or no uh, fat is what we call a lean bread, right? Um, and um, anything that is a rich bread, like brioche, for example, is extremely rich, is when we have high amounts of sugar or fat. Sweet dough is rich, uh, like um, a certain white bread can be rich, right? So a white bread is often considered an enriched dough because you usually have 2% uh, sugar and 2% fat in that uh, based on baker's percent. Um, Sorry, one second here. I'm just trying to juggle this. I, I just see I got to check my battery on my, my iPad there too. One second. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll do that probably. Let me just have a look quickly. Oh, this cable's not working. Okay. I'm wondering if it's been plugged into the battery the whole time. No, the battery's fine, but the, the cables, I got a, another cable. Sorry for the minor technical difficulty. Still not charging. You sure that bottom one is in there, yeah. Chef? That is strange. That's really odd. Hmm. Maybe the iPad draws too much power. Uh, if you put the video on it, if you can plug that in. Sorry, what the mess of things here. That is really strange. I don't is know what's going, going on. You got to charge up. Not going for some reason. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now it says it's charging. Yep. I got some. Thank you. Oh, Shelby, you like Oh, no. I'm okay right now. Thank you. It looks like it's charging. See, uh, I'm, I'm getting the, the lightning bolt. 
It's just that, oh yeah. Okay, it's starting to slowly go back up now too. Okay. It's just, I guess at one point, maybe it was it's using, more using more juice than it was uh, getting. Yeah, right? yeah. Hopefully that'll work for the rest of the day. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. But this will be kind of a great review for you guys, right? It's here. Uh, you can go back and watch this. Oh, is this, is this all set? Yeah, yeah. That's filed for for benchmark. Yeah, we're recording it on Zoom, and there's a there's a couple people watching. So Mark, you can help talk about that a bit. Where he has a big media. So yeah, another another website you can jot down as, as Chef is mentioning is bakerpedia.com. So think Wikipedia, this Bakerpedia. And it is a free resource for commercial bakers, right? So bakerpedia.com. Yeah. And um, so that's where I uh, work part time, um, fill my time part time. Um, I am the community forum manager and instructor, and I also do the Baked and Science podcast. is a a monthly podcast that I post, um, and I do a every Friday. I do a, a video blog on um, social media. It get it goes to Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Um, it's all for Bakerpedia, yeah. Um, so, and that that on on Fridays we talk about what's going on, the posts, some of the interesting posts from the forum, um, because we have a forum community forum like a bulletin board set up for all kinds of different discussion uh, channels of things like whether it's ingredients or breads or cakes or cookies or other specialty things. Um, and so this is the brainchild of a lady. Uh, she's got her PhD in grain science. Um, Dr. Lynn, her name is Lynn Carson. Everybody calls her Dr. Lynn. And um, I got to know her a number of years ago. And after I retired, I came on board with their team and um, it's a group of people doing various things everywhere. There's some in Singapore, um, most of us all in North America and uh, the, the, like the operations managers in Scotland. And so it's really neat working with um, you know, internet teams, it's all remote location teams, right? We use a space called uh, Slack um, to communicate and things like that is really, really interesting. So it's a great resource. If you want to know anything about an ingredient, they keep posting new ingredient papers all the time. So if you wanted to learn about lecithin, for example, you could go to bakerpedia.com, click on resources, ingredients, and you'll see them all listed in alphabetical order. You click on lecithin and it'll tell you about lecithin, where it comes from, how it's used. Um, basically, and it'll usually tell you, like, say, take six minutes to read this or eight minutes. It's not in depth, like, it's not a big scientific paper or something like that. It gives you the basics of what you need to know as a baker, um, you know, or for me, you know, especially as a commercial baker to help understand things and, and to produce good products. Um, so it's a really great resource. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna start off with the um, getting the, the sourdough ready because uh, it's gonna take the longest through the, the rest of our afternoon. And so I've weighed up, I have my 150 grams of Caroline, which is my sour, and I have 800, what do you have in the oven right now, right? Yep. We already have that in the oven because it won't be ready by the time we're done. Um, so we, we made one earlier, just like for this morning's class, I made one yesterday and, and so on, right? Um, and, and, and you know what you have to get this question? You get the menace, you see the question. Oh, 
I get lots of love is what I get. <laughs> you have a question? Okay. Oh, this is pies and puff pastry. Yeah, yeah I, I think I left it in my locker. <laughs> Okay, so I have the 800 water. I take a small amount of the water. It says in the recipe to use most of the water in with the flour. So what I'm doing is I'm just gonna take a little bit to help thin out my sour to make it easier to get out of the bowl. That's really all that's about. And so I have all of the, the flour here and I'm using um, the bread flour and whole wheat flour here alone. And we'll talk a bit some more because the one, the one I did here yesterday is this has rye flour in it as well. And so you can see the difference in flavor and texture, it changes quite a bit. Um, and I will add the yeast in at this point as well. Okay, I'll blend the yeast in with the flour because we're using instant yeast. The, uh, do you know the difference between instant and active yeast? Anybody? No, okay. Um, first of all, visually, instant yeast is a really fine, dry little pearl, right? Um, I'll get the bin over here. So this is instant yeast. You can see it's it's really it's really fine. It's like a tiny little granules, right? And whereas active yeast is darker in color and they're much bigger pearls, right? And active yeast is a bit misleading. Instant yeast is instant. You just add it into the flour, it dissolves instantly and so on. Active yeast is actually this little bit misleading because it has to be activated um, in terms of from the user's perspective. It's active because it's a different type of bacteria, slightly different than the instant, and it's it wrapped inside a starch shell. So we have to first take it and put it in warm water with a tiny bit of sugar or warm milk, uh, which has sugar in it already. And you have to let it dissolve that starch layer to let that active yeast out and start to bloom, right? We don't have to do that with instant, okay? So with instant, we just mix it in. I put a small amount of water in with the sour, okay? And the rest of the water I'm putting in with the flour and the yeast. And I'm making my autolase. Right? Autolase is a French term, um, which is essentially meaning we're allowing it to hydrate automatically or naturally, okay? And so we're just combining it to what we will refer to as a shaggy dough because it, it looks shaggy. You know, you can see that it looks it's all shaggy hair. Like if I didn't have my hair in a tied up, it would be all shaggy. Mm -hmm. Chef Donald can't do that. <laughs> so I just kind of scrape that all together. And note that I do not have the salt in yet. It's important. Don't, you don't want to put the salt in too early because the salt will compete with the gluten for water and it will compete with the yeast for water. So salt is 
It's important to regulate the fermentation, promote flesh color, strengthen the gluten. But in the beginning, it's important not to have the salt in too soon because of what in science will say osmotic pressure, because it is so strong in sucking up the water and taking it away from everything else. It'll harm the bacteria, it'll harm the gluten and everything. And so, no, no, only in one of them, only in the focaccia, because it looks like almost like a household recipe off the internet, right? Um, and so now the, the starter that I have a little bit of the water in, so you see, by blending it a little bit with the water, it'll make it really easy to get it out of the bowl, okay? And what I like to do at this point, we're gonna let this stand for a good 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes for the gluten to hydrate, okay? Um, the, the one of the misleading things often is that we think of this big amount of flour that we're moistening the flour but really this, the most of the flour is starch. Only about 10 to 14% of the flour is gluten protein. And the protein is the main thing that is soaking up water. The starch just gets coated with water on the outside. And until you bake it, that's when the starch unlocks and grabs the water. And some of it is evaporated, of course, during the baking process. But the, the starch doesn't actually do its job until it's in the oven. Of course, it does provide food for the yeast as well as the enzymes break it down and it consumes some of that. Um, but the main job the starch does is to unlock and seal in the baking and the cooking process. So right now, what's hydrating is the gluten. And that's what we refer to as gluten development because you're taking, there's a variety of proteins in wheat flour, but the two most abundant and important proteins are gliadine and glutenin. And so, um, the so celiacs are, for example, are primarily uh, sensitive to gliadine, right? And um, the test for gluten-free is done testing gliadine, right? And so even though barley has gliadine and glutenin in it, it's mostly gliadine and not enough glutenin to form gluten. The same thing in rye flour and, and so on, right? Um, so it's, it's the wheat flour has this, this magic balance of the two proteins that produces such a wonderful result in, in bread making. Now, of course, there's, there's all kinds of controversy, uh, uh, controversial books and things out there. Uh, there's one gentleman, a doctor who wrote a book called The Wheat Belly and talks about how we are poisoning ourselves by eating wheat and things like that. And, you know, and to each his own. I mean, if that's what they want to believe, that's, that's fine, but I mean, Bread's been around for bread has been around for over six thousand years, and I don't see it extinguishing any populations. Right? Um, so um, uh, now there are people who are gluten sensitive. Agree, totally agree. Uh, um, celiac is celiac is an autoimmune disease where the 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 body, the intestine starts attacking itself because it doesn't know what to do with, with this this gluten protein. Um, and they are working on that. They're discovering um, through different fermentation processes that they can change the gluten to make it digestible even for celiacs. So it's in its very infancy of research right now, but there is very promising research that they figure in about another maybe 10 to 15 years, they might have something that where you can make more standard breads that are uh, consider, uh, considered celiac friendly. Whole grain breads, yeah. whole grains. So yeah, I can talk about that a bit too. Um, is I'm just going to set this aside to uh, to rest, so because we, we want to give that a good um, thirty to forty minute rest. I'm just going to put this out of the way. With so I just used the sour to cover it to keep it nice and moist. So I don't have to put a plastic or anything like that over it. So that way it doesn't dry out. Right? Um, yeah. 
right? Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 It'll start. It's actually growing. It's actually growing in there. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on how warm your your home is. Um, it may grow faster, and then it sort of it peters out. Okay, because the pH has dropped so low that now it can't ferment anymore, and so there's just this this fluid that sits on top. Right now, if it gets green or black then it's garbage <laughs> but that usually takes quite a few days right um uh um i've had that happen to me once so you know, it's, mistakes happen right or you forget yeah. things right um and um but yeah whole grain is essentially literally what the world word means whole grain okay so when it comes to wheat breads for example it's a little bit more confusing in Canada than in some other countries, um, because in Canada, um, the the milling practices back in the 1940s and 50s, I think it was, was when they wanted to encourage people to eat more uh, brown bread, more whole wheat bread. Um, the flour millers, the, the Canadian Milling Association got together with the government and came up with this idea that to engineer whole wheat flour. So Canadian whole wheat flour is different in that uh, in the milling process, what they do is they remove the bran and they remove the germ, and then they, they do a split run milling. So they, they produce all purpose flour, which is considered a B grade flour. And from that, they produce a G grade flour, which is high protein, high in ash. Ash is a mineral uh, that can be measured, right? And so, and then what they do is they blend the bran back in, but only the bran, not the germ and not the clears, the other high protein, poor bacon quality flour. So that would be considered, we could get that here in Canada is, is stone ground whole wheat, right? Um, so stone ground is when everything is left in and the whole thing is just ground up on a stone. And now there's some companies out there that are trying to push this idea where they called it stone cold milling, right? And they they only rotate the stone very slowly so that the temperature doesn't get higher than 80 degrees. And they say it produces better flavor and things like that. What it produces mostly to my mind is to change because they charge you four times as much for a bag of flour than you pay for anything else. Right? Um, and, uh, and their only proof is that they believe. It says on their website, they, they believe it tastes better. They believe it does things better, right? Um, so anyway, um, but, yeah, but whole, that, that's the, the, key, the key thing is, but whole grains are good for our diet, a fiber, like the bran, things like that, but also um, the germ, the, the uh, German whole wheat and, uh, and, and wheat and other uh, types of uh, grains, is high in uh, good fat. Um, so things like uh, omega-3s and omega-9 fatty acids. And these are needed to metabolize certain vitamins and minerals, right? So you could take all the vitamin pills you want if you don't eat the right kind of oils to go with it, like omega-3s, omega-6, and omega-9, um, then you won't be able to metabolize those vitamins. And in other words, you're just, you're just paying money to put it down the toilet the long way, right? Um, <laughs> quite literally, in a sense, right? Um, so, um, so they, there's like uh, what there has happened in Canada is with what a lot of larger bakeries do is they take whole wheat flour and they add the germ back in to simulate the same constituents of that is in the flour because those are the main important components, right? Um, so that they can be sold as whole grain also in the, in the United States and stuff, right? Um, but there's other grains that are considered whole grain, like oats are one we tend to eat as a whole grain as it is, because it is, there's, there's no brand to remove. Um, it's just the whole oat, yep. The, the B grade, yeah, yeah, so. And it, it does nothing to do with quality. It just has to do with the way the mill streams are in, the, in a flour mill, okay? So this, this wheatlet, this, this coarse stuff, this is an A grade, 
Okay. Um, so this is the first first when it's first cracked apart, and you end up the only difference with these with the cream of wheat is the the bran was left on, right? Okay. But in a regular flour mill, the bran is taken off and the germ is taken off, and then they start cracking the wheat down. So A is the semolina type wheat, the, the wheatlets, the farina. Um, B grade tends to be the um, all-purpose flour, like the, the top pattern, right? I've never seen a C grade for some reason, um, but then D grade is strong bakers. Um, and I've never seen an E, but then there's F and G, which are high protein, high ash flours that are used in whole grain breads and rye breads because they're very high in gluten, but they're high in ash, high in minerals. So the flour is very gray in color, not creamy white, right? Whereas strong bakers is creamy yellow and all purpose is creamy white. Right? Um, then there's flours that are bleached, okay? Um, bleached flour is simply changing the pigment, nothing else. It has no functionality whatsoever all it does is make the flour white, okay? And that was, due to, that was literally due to uh, consumers wanting... Consumers wanted whiter bread, yeah. It was, you know, um, wheat, just, wheat just black. People would buy black wheat, so they spread dye. That was that mm -hmm. spread. They might need the flour. They want, they want that crazy flour. Well, it, it's, it's, the flour naturally tends to be like a creamy yellow, right? And so uh, in the, the old days, long ago, what bakers would do is flour would be sold in, in like it's still in the US, they, they, they sell flour, they, they price it based on what they call hundred weights. You'll see CWT is the short form for hundred weight, meaning a hundred pound. And flour used to be packed in a hundred pound uh, jute sacks, like a cloth type of sack, so it can breathe. And so the baker would continuously be taking flour in and it would usually have a, a cellar or somewhere where he stored it in sacks and would have to rotate these sacks every month to allow them to breathe because that is how you would age the flour to to oxidize it to make it wider and to get more enzyme activity for for bread baking so it would take about six months of aging the flour turning it over every month before you could actually use it so you had to have continuous inventory you have to imagine you know as a bakery you had to have more than six months worth of inventory on hand all the time because you were constantly rotating um, it would have been such a staple at that time. yeah and then of course you know commercial production came into play and silos and things like that well so now how are they going to age it well to to get the enzymes they add amylase or they add malt right easy but then the color didn't change right so that's when they came up with bleaching. Now, bleaching in Europe is not allowed anymore um, because the bleaching, it's not so much the consumer when they eat the flour, it's the, the workers at the mill and the processors and things like that because it's benzoyl peroxide that is used to bleach it. And if they inhale that, um, they could cause cancer, right? So it's, it's a known carcinogen and it can cause cancer. There's other things that are not allowed in flour anymore either. We used to, quite abundantly use uh, uh, potassium bromate, which it is still used in some states in the US, um, but in Canada and most of the US, it's been, uh, it's been banned for many years already for decades, right? Um, and, um, and so there's that type of thing. So the bleaching just, just to make it white, because consumers wanted white bread. When I first started with the milling group, the Maritimes was actually very slow to change away from white, white bread. When we tried to give them unbleached flour um, for making white bread that looked like a creamy yellow in the crumb, uh-uh, they didn't like it at all, right? Um, was not their thing, right? Um, oh, thank you, chef. Um, and, uh, and so, um, but then there's other forms of bleaching that are still used in North America and not as widely in the rest of the world, not in, in uh, Europe at all. And that is uh, if you buy, if you've ever used cake flour, not pastry flour, cake flour. And cake flour is a brilliant white and it's very, very fine. And how they do that is that when the flour is done milling, it goes through like a, a, a pipe or an area where they open a valve 
and put chlorine gas in onto it. So it's chlorinated, right? So the chlorination, again, it's not what we eat it when we consume it, it's the effects on the, the people working with it and that. So it's been, it's not allowed in Europe anymore. But what it does is it denatures the protein so that these, these flowers don't form these tough rubbery protein networks anymore. And it, it allows it to take up more water though at the same time. So it's used in making high ratio cakes to make things that are really tender and fluffy and where you don't want that rubberiness from, from all purpose flour or things like that. So it, it's used there and um, we're slowly getting away from that, um, but it's, it's uh, quite widely still used in, in US and Canada. Uh, is this the addition or the, the uh, influx of people doing partisan breads and things that so environmental be, awareness, um, health the, awareness. The bleaching, sort of, the bleaching thing, I think, came as a myth to consumers that, you know, bleach, bleach flour was a, an absolute health uh, risk to them. And you know what? And the thing is, sometimes what, what, what if, uh, if those who want to protect even just the workers in general or just the, or the environment and everything, if that's what works, that's go with so it, right? Okay. Run with it, right? You know, and that just kind of so, yeah, it's just like with so many of the mis much of the misinformation that's on the internet today, anyway, right? Um, but you know, it's, it's sometimes people will spread misinformation with the intent of really trying to get a certain message across. But then if, if you aren't able to control it, it goes awry and into all kinds of other things, right? Uh, but you know, it is a health concern. It really isn't directly to us. Some people like to believe that. It's primarily to the workers who are, are exposed to it. Uh, because once you get the, the chlorinated flour, there's no chlorine there anymore. It's gone. It, but it had its already its effect on the flour, right? Um, and so it, you can't ingest it anymore. Um, it's, it's at the mill state when it's the most dangerous. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, a, there's, it's a mixed bag of things, okay? Um, there are, a lot of it comes down to the, the political structures of the, the, the countries as well, because um, there's especially like Germany and France who are like the main, and in Italy, the, the main uh, economic areas, centers of, of Europe are very uh, socially oriented, right? Um, and uh, um, like in um, minimum vacation in uh, Germany is four weeks a year, right? Minimum. Right after one year of service, right? yeah, yeah. But well, by the higher time you have some service. Uh, certain ones, not not all, but um, but anyway, it's it's very socially oriented, and um, um, in the U.S. there is, for example, there's no minimum vacation. Zero. There's uh, the labor laws in the U.S. Like even compared to Canada, are crazy, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. There's there's legally there's no minimum vacation in the U.S. Right? Um, no health insurance. Yeah, I had to have emergency open heart surgery, so um, I can tell you lots about that, right? Um, but yeah, so. Uh, in terms of, there's a lot of things that are illegal in Europe that we still do here or in certain ways, or there are things that we don't allow here and they do allow in Europe. Yeah. Okay, so there, there's, and for different reasons, sometimes the thing is people like to just cherry pick something on the surface without looking at, you know, the iceberg underneath, right, of what, what the bigger story is, right? Um, for example, eggs. We all, we here in North America, we're always refrigerating our eggs because they, they're going to get sick if you don't refrigerate the eggs, right? Well, the whole reason we refrigerate the eggs is because in our egg industry, we wash them. We wash the eggs after the, the chickens have laid them, and we wash off all of the protective layer of the egg. So it has to be kept refrigerated as a result, or it will spoil, right? Whereas in Europe, they do not wash the eggs. 
and they do not refrigerate them either. So they're, yeah. they're protected. They're protected. So right. Thank you. This time I'm going to remember to turn it up. You know that we used to take the troops and uh, open the door. Open the door. Yep. Open the door. Thank you. In front of the fire. The tenderize. So they're kind of. So Great, thanks. That, yeah, we're, we're totally illegal to do now. Like, you can't nail the goose to people before. That's not how it is. Kids aren't required to work full time. Kids are at work full time. Or work, or work, or work. Or work, or work, or work. <laughs> I know, that's okay. Don't worry. I'll figure, thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Hope it's not too heavy. Yeah. Okay, so before I, I, I go to the next one quickly, while well, we have these here, um, is I want to show you, so how we tell if they're done. Well, one might be the timer went off. But if you set the timer too short, it doesn't mean they're done just because the timer went off. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that as a baker with experience, you can tell by the sound how hollow it is. Right? You can hold it up to your ear and you can hear how hollow it is and you know, okay, that's, it's had enough moisture evaporated and cooked all the way through, it sounds hollow enough. To be sure, what you do is you take an instant read thermometer and stick it in there. And we have 94, 97, 98. So as long as we're like above 95, getting close to 100 degrees Celsius, I always say a little over 200, 205 Fahrenheit, um, they're cooked. They're done, they're baked through. Should have been a cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful. And we're going to cut these open in a little while and then you can sample them. And so that's the, the most important way to, che to check is with a thermometer. And the whole reason I have this is because I still do it at home all the time. And th this one's a really, really fast. I love this one. It's a it's a therm, therm pro. I found it on Amazon and it was like 20 bucks, I think, right? So it wasn't super expensive. Um, and it is literally, it's instant. It's really quick as you saw how fast it gives you a readout. And that's important, especially if it's not quite done and you want to get it back in. You don't want to have to wait a long time for the reading to come up, right? It's called a therm pro. Yeah. It's an instant read thermometer. And there's a website in the US, they will ship to Canada too. They have all kinds of different uh, um, pens and stuff is uh, Thermal Works, I think it's called, right? And that's where I got, yeah, Thermal Works. Baby, baby Prince is another one. Yeah. And that's where I got this, this from was uh, Thermal Works, right? Um, so this is my chef thermometer I carry with me all the time. And so I have different probes in here for sous vide, for checking oven or reproof for term temperature. Or uh, you know, if I if I want to cook or bake with the probe in it, um, and so this I bought this one. It has a, an alarm on it, um, so I can set the high and low temperature as well. So like when we're at the market, I use one of the ovens as a proofer, and so I'm always checking, keeping the temperature between 82 and 96. So it, it beeps to tell me when it's getting too warm or too cool. So I can I can look after that, and uh, they're very handy. So Thermal Works is a they're a good company. Um, 
it's not cheap to ship to Canada sometimes, but if if you're in need of a really good thermometer, it's it's worth it, right? Um, and fluke is another one. I've got a, yep. got a fluke similar to the fluke. fluke yep. Two of them actually. Yeah, and JB Prince has a ton of good stuff, all kinds JB of baking Prince. and culinary. It's like a it's like a candy store, right? Candy store. The, the magazine, two <laughs> Oh, Lee Valley. And my wife used to work for Lee Valley. Yeah. Thank you very much. There we go. Sure, yeah, why don't we take a short break? Uh, oh, actually, just before we, we break, let me start to show you the baguette. Same, similar situation as what we started with the, um, uh, the sourdough. The difference is that we have a poolish. A poolish is uh, equal parts of water and flour, but not over several days, just overnight once. Anywhere from six to 18 hours, typically. We will be making the foolish on Thursday and using it on Friday, right? Is what? Foolish, P O O L I S H. It's in there, it's in uh, under the baguette recipe. Yeah. It, it really means Polish. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's a it's an homage to the Polish bakers that came to France. The French are going to say it's being chef, not I will. The French claim everything is theirs. Spaghetti, <laughs> everything is theirs. Pasta, everything is theirs. You know, that, that all of these things, they all came from here to eat from the French are like that. You do it best. The, the French have refined a lot of things. Um, it's put, it, it's terminology. It's, a lot of terminology. Yeah. it's, it's like we, we talked about earlier this morning uh, croissants. Croissants are not originally from France. The, croissant, the French refined it and repopularized it, but croissants actually are originally from Austria. Um, and they were created as a symbolic devouring of the Turkish crescent on the flag when Austria defeated the, the Ottoman Empire, right? Um, so, so there was like, he was like, yeah, take this, you Turks. <laughs> Their flag, yeah. And to represent that, they made the croissant in the shape of this Turkish symbol and they eat it. So just to say, hey, these are Turkish, they're going to eat that. It's such a great story. So here again, I'm doing an, an auto lace where um, this time with the, the baguette, we're putting the water in, the yeast, and the poolish. And so you can see the poolish is not liquid like the, the sour. It has a little bit of body to it. And it, you, depending on how long you ferment it, it may have more or less body. Um, and this recipe calls for a a one-to-one -one foolish, so it's it's equal parts water and flour, which is the most common. <clears throat> Some of them have a little bit more water, but then they usually have a shorter fermentation time. And so here we're kind of mixing this together again into what we're calling a shaggy dough. And that we're not missing to develop a, a fully developed dough. We just want to get all of the flour wet. So that the, the gluten can work on hydrating and sucking that all up. Just going to put a glove on and mix it through a bit. And then we'll take a short. So again, I did not put the salt in. I wait to put the salt in until I'm 
I have the auto lasers done. I talked about this with you guys. We're not just dumping the salt in. We're starting the corporation process off of that. Like sprinkling it on the top. We dump it on one spot. Like any season, it's going to be hard to get through. We're not going to dump it on the side. And so now I'm just going to let this sit for half an hour. And then I'm going to incorporate the salt and start the the folding process, okay? All right, so let's take a short break now, and then, yep, I'll put that down there. Yep. Let me just spray a little. I'm just gonna spray a little bit of water on it to keep it from drying out. And, uh, or you can put plastic, That's, there's no harm in, in doing that. But, um, And that's good. We're we're good for a few minutes. Okay, so ten to two guys, just uh, fifteen minutes. Touch your legs. Do whatever you have to do to stay awake for the last uh, part here. We're on the home stretch. They eat some bread. Oh, nice! Yeah. Yeah, little units. We got them all over the kitchen yeah. here. That's always been our, our battle in, in Decatur. Is like, well, getting the money for scales. We, we couldn't get money for good ones like that. And uh, and they were just the ones that they they got these rubber made ones, which are pretty good. The, the students just destroyed. Them. Yeah, that's I mean, it. Um, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. So it goes they fit right all over there. Oh, good instructor card. I see. Yeah. So this you'll try to find it. Yeah. Uh, That's where mm -hmm. I grab that flower. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, good. So it's going pretty good? Fantastic. Good. Now that one fellow has a little trouble staying away. Yeah, yeah. But I'm like that too. If I'm going to sit down, uh, you know, I get people who, if I'm sitting down, I'm like, missing so much you know? yeah it's it's trying to get yourself like you said get up and walk around or something yeah, like that exactly. right? stand up for a second that's all yeah. you gotta do mm -hmm. you're driving the car i'm gonna try to do the next one at 16. tell us we played a rock wall and then a culvert culvert then both of them and uh now i stop you want to walk around the car you're good it's all mm -hmm. And uh, even other things, I mean, as you get older, at least anyway, like for me, but um, I forgot on, on Saturday, I, uh, but I got them on today, it helps a lot, is uh, I found, stumbled on um, compression socks. Compression socks. Um, makes a big difference. Do you find a big difference? Yeah, because I get cramps in my calves otherwise. See, I had a yeah. stroke, right? It just really yeah. big. It, uh, it's almost like sleep all the time it might help it helps the circulation essentially is what it does because right? like when like when we drive back to decatur and that or whenever i fly um i always wearing compression socks too these are athletic ones that i found yeah and i also have just um compression sleeves just for my caps wow. um ah, so they're just like a strip that comes up on yeah it's just like it just soft. goes from here to here oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. um and i wear those when i'm cycling Right, because yeah. uh, hmm? you do a lot of cycling. I'm trying to get back into it. I was doing a lot before my surgery. I just sort of started picking up again, because especially in in um, in the Decatur in the Midwest, it's flat, eh? Yeah. So um, I mean, we'd go for 
there was a group of guys that I'm still friend with. We would get together every Saturday and we would go ride for about 40, 50 kilometers. Wow. Um, that, would, that was a short one. Wow. <laughs> it was a quick one. Yeah. Um, then we would do other rides where we do like uh, uh, 40 miles, which is about a little over 60 kilometers, right? Um, like almost 70 kilometers. Uh, and the longest one I did is uh, um, 64 miles. Um, which is a metric century, it's 100 kilometers. Metric century, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and so in, well, I was working my way up actually that year to do a century, to do 100 miles, right? It would be 160 kilometers. Right? Yeah. And then I had the surgery and it's been tough coming back from that, that's all. Right? And it'll be tougher yeah. here than... Uh, uh, yeah, I went, when we, after we Midwest. moved to North Sydney, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And yeah, I, I rode up Musgrave to um, Puddle Lake there. Yeah, right? even that. <laughs> you know, that, at least that was going downhill that way, right? <laughs> I rode around to the Walmart and all that there, and then, and then started coming back, and it's like, oh, shit, I hate hills. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny, yeah. Yeah, you don't have that here. Well, yeah, we're all surrounded by hills where we are, right? So I'm, I've am i I've hooked up with the Velo Cape Breton group, right? Um. So well, they've got a yeah. bunch of cool things. Like one of them yeah. is, uh, and I'm sure you've heard of this before. They, I used to do them in, at the market that they call three wheelers. Mm -hmm. So they have a van, mm -hmm. all your gear. Yeah. You stay in the best places. Like they come to the market yeah. land and they wine and dine, and ride off on their bikes in the morning. The van would go and then they'd head to the Celtic, spend the night in the Celtic, wine and dine. Well, they do a, they do a, um, a four days around the Cabot Trail. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. right. It's they, in July. Yeah, yeah, and all their gear is taken yeah. care of. They had to cancel it last year because of COVID. Like, I remember one lady, she was 19. Uh -huh. She finished dinner and then she jogged down to her cabin. Like, <laughs> but they were, they were great income because mm -hmm. it's a high end kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They were coming up with more horse dinner. Mm -hmm. But uh, very interesting people. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're a good bunch. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, that. Uh, yeah, I've, I've met some of them you're just virtually. Asshole, right? I find if you're yeah. into that kind yeah. of thing, you just yeah. I don't know. They're they're really nice people. Yeah, they're not they're not stuck up about no, it or anything. No. Yeah, it's like people at scuba dive. I remember yeah. my chef at Zurich telling me, "You want to get rid of stress in your life? Yeah. Scuba dive." <laughs> yeah, if you're a chef. Learn how to scuba dive. Yeah, kind of true, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know you. Any kind of exercise. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. You know, that's true. I mean, it's it's one of those things. It's 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 weird to try and describe it or justify it or explain. But like when when we lived in Decatur, um, part of you know working for ADM is they have their own gym in there. It's it's a it's an old elementary school they bought right. a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. They spent over a million dollars fixing it up. It's a beautiful gym. They have you know they you have lockers, you have showers. Everything on great weight equipment, all kinds yeah. of treadmills. No excuse. And it's up, yeah, and they're open at 5 a.m. and they're open till nine o'clock at night. So right? camps, yeah. camps, you get the best of gyms. Yeah, so we'll have three stories. Of, I think I can show you some pictures of some of the gyms we get apparently. And some you of know, the nicest you'd see. And yeah. I have to say, I miss that because it was free. Me too. I and I would just go, but now do do I want to join a gym here and start going? And it's like. Especially now with the pandemic, it makes yeah. it so complicated. I, three months, and, I did three, it was still three months before the pandemic, and, mm -hmm. I, and I used to do the gym quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And then it just uh, it comes and it goes. But I, I wish I was going now. It's it's a good way to get rid of stress. And, 100%. Yeah. I'm and, a different person when I'm doing it. I'm a different yeah. person. Yes.
Okay, well, uh, I want to get the focaccia started. Or we're doing, we're making a focaccia um, where it says ciabatta in the recipe. Um, before we continue with the others, because it also has to have a at least a short auto lays um, and to allow everything to hydrate and stuff. One of the the differences, first of all, is that the pre ferment we're using here is a bigger. So there, the different pre ferments that we're seeing today is we're seeing the sourdough starter. We're seeing the Poolish and we're seeing the Biga. The other ones that also are used are Levin. And a Levin just means like a leftover piece of dough from the previous day's production or something like that. Um, or you just make up a piece of dough to use as your pre-ferment starter. Um, the other one is called a sponge. Uh, sponges can be anywhere from four to eight, 12 hours, right? Um, and they are sort of between a poolish and a biga. They're not as wet as a poolish and not as stiff as a biga. Um, but the sponge usually contains all of the yeast and is fermented. And it's all about creating flavor as well as uh, fermentation power. Most of your commercial pan breads, the white breads that you would buy sliced white are usually done with a sponge and dough process. <laughs> so I've got the yeast mixed into my flour. And I've got the water here. Now in the recipe, it calls for milk uh, to activate the yeast, but because we're using instant yeast, we don't need to activate it. And um, the other thing is, because I'm not using milk, I cut back a little bit on the water because I don't, because part of that 75 grams of milk, roughly seven grams of that is milk solid. And so I don't want to use 75 grams water because then I would have too much. So I'm only using 65 grams of water plus the 295 to make my focaccia. Right? And so pour that water in and I'm going to add the bigger. As you can see, the bigger is the stiffest of all of our pre-ferments. Uh, the bigger in this recipe is not super stiff, um, but it is it's definitely firmer than the others. Some of them have only uh, 50 percent hydration. I've seen bigas as low as 45. They're, they're really difficult to work with. But 50 percent hydration for a biga is very common, meaning only like for 100 grams of flour, only 50 grams of water. It's very stiff. If you make it in a small batch like that at home to do that kind of a biga, the easiest way to stir it and mix it is with the, the handle of a spoon. Okay, it's not, not the, the spoon part, but just the handle makes it really easy or a pair of chopsticks right? um, works really, really good. My, my wife prefers to use chopsticks. That's what she's is easier for her. She uses chopsticks for everything, right? Um, but that's also because she's from Hong Kong, right? So she, yeah. Oh yes, yeah, we got lots of chopsticks. Right? And, um, and so the, the other way would be, if you're a little bit larger batch would be with a paddle and a mixer. So we wanna mix this up to get everything again, nicely hydrated, nice and wet. So we can allow it to stand to soak up all the water before we start the, the folding process, mix the salt in, start the folding process to let it um, finish fermenting before 
our final shape. because I want to try and see if I can get this one uh, baked for you guys before. We might run about 10, 15 minutes over if that is okay with your schedule. Bread is always tough because of all the long fermentation times, right? And, uh, and the resting time and everything else. Um, when I was teaching the, the, the bread class that I would teach in Decatur was night class. So we would, we would start at um, six o'clock. No, we started at five, sorry. Started at five o'clock. Uh, we'd have 45 minutes of lecture. Uh, to basically discuss what it is we're going to do and how to do it and set up the teams. Because um, I'd usually have 12 students and they would usually work in teams of two. And then we would end up finishing around midnight. And, uh, but that's the way bread is. Right? So there we go, nicely mixed up. And so this one, I'm just going to cover loosely with a cloth just to keep a draft off of it. It's not about keeping it wet as much as keeping moving air off of it so it doesn't dry out too much. Right? Um, but the same idea, this is going to have to uh, rest for half an hour before we can continue with the kneading process. So now we can go back to our sourdough. And at this point, we can now put in the salt and work it into the dough. So this is where what Chef Donald was talking about. You don't wanna just dump the salt in in one spot. You wanna kind of sprinkle it in. Always, always, whether it's uh, something you're seasoning or a roast or a, uh, it's the difference between, again, the difference between a cook and a chef. We'll see if you start that roast that way. Try to make it as level as possible. Sure, yep. And so now we just work in that sour and the salt. And it's not vigorous kneading, it's, it's just really like a, a folding process to get it all worked in. And at this point to accelerate it a little bit for you guys and keep it moving quickly, I'm gonna be putting it in the proofer to do the fermentation. So it'll go a little faster, give it a warmer environment to grow in. Cause I can feel right now too, the dough is only about 68. Let's see how good I still am with my temperatures. When I was a technician, that was really good. When I did tick service, I could stick my hand in the dough and tell the bakery operator what, what temperature his dough was. Where did I put my thermometer? There we go. So let's see, how bad am I? Oh, well. I missed by one degree. Oh no, it's 68.9, okay. <laughs> I'm out of practice. So this is gonna go in the, in the proofer. This, is, this needs to rise now a bit, and then we're going, you'll see the stretch and fold, right? And how that works. And while we're waiting for the, the poolish and the, uh, I mean, the, uh, the baguette and the focaccia breads to finish resting up, we're gonna sample some bread. So what I have here is, I'll cut some more up here. Is, so first of all, 
is I made some up yesterday uh, that I baked off yesterday at home. And this is the one following in the recipe in your handout that has 300 grams of whole wheat flour and 100 grams of rye flour. And so you'll see the difference in color and you'll be able to also taste the difference. So if you want to pass that around. And you can see the, the difference on the crumb here as well, where I cut it open sideways for you. And then this morning, the loaf we made has um, 300 grams. Uh, so this is actually, I made this up last night and I baked it off this morning here. And this has no rye flour, but it has the 300 grams of whole wheat in it, okay? Everything else is the same. You can already hear it. It's got a crisper crust, right? um, a little bit nicer crust to it. You'll see it's, it's much more open, right? And it's, a, it's not as gray in color, okay? <clears throat> A little bit more. So, and then we have the ones that we just baked earlier. And here I went a little bit lower on the whole wheat flour. So again, no rye flour, but this time instead of 300 grams of whole wheat, there's only 200 grams of whole wheat, right? So subtle difference, but still a difference. Right? You can see how much brighter the crumb is again. And again, now it's be becoming a little bit more even less irregular, right? Uh, because of the strength of the flour. And the crust is really nice on this too. Pass that around. Now slice this one open as well. So you can see how nice and so much lighter the, the crust is. Nothing like fresh bread, eh? Must be good. It, it, yeah, it all depends on what you're looking for in terms of flavor characteristics. They're, they all have their, 
goodness, so to speak. But if you like something that's really soft and fluffy and stuff, then yeah, the less whole wheat flour, the more white flour, the more voluminous it is because there's more strength there. There's more that can expand and stretch. So if you made yours, which is all white flour, like all bread flour, it makes a beautiful loaf as well, right? Um, <clears throat> and so here's our um, baguette now. And I'm going to yeah, make sure I don't have things mixed up here at all. Good. So I'm going to put my salt into the baguette dough and knead that in. And then it's going to go in the proofer as well. And you can see already at this stage, once it has had a chance to sit and pick up the water as I'm just folding it around, it cleans the bowl already. It's, it's all coming off the bowl. Right? What we call, a, when you're kneading it in a mixer, you would call it the cleanup stage. There we go. I'm just going to moisten it a bit and then get that into the proofer. Yeah, those magnets are strong. <clears throat> So we, we, uh, we talked about RCA and stuff like that. Um, another one on the food side that might be of interest is, is good to have as a resource too is the uh, Institute of Food Technologists and that's uh, ift.org. There are so many food or food ingredient related associations and groups. Um, you know, you could specialize in all kinds of different things. So IFT, is food generally all, all like food scientists technologists and things like that food engineers even um, who work on the equipment and designing the equipment to work with food and stuff so they need to work with people like you guys and, and stuff like that too to understand you know process tolerances and all these kinds of things um, there's even um, uh, a group I uh, was involved with for a while um, and did some demos and things. And I did uh, um, a couple of uh, entertainment pieces, I guess you might call it, is it's called uh, candytech.org. And it's the, um, the candy technologists uh, in the US. And uh, so they focus on all kinds of confectionery things. And um, at their uh, annual technical conference, um, I got invited to be a team member for an iron confectioner battle. Um, and so it was a lot of fun. And basically there was a secret ingredient and we had one hour to come up with um, three different, uh, 25 pieces of each, three different uh, confections or treats using the secret ingredient. Um, and so there was two teams and this was just done like in a hotel where the hotel provided us with microwaves, hot plates, a fridge, a freezer, and some banquet tables. So that was it. Right. And, uh, and so I had a lot of fun. So um, I was crowned iron confectioner two years in a row, and then they made me a judge. Right. So, <laughs> um, and we came up with just a lot of interesting ideas. The, the one that I remember the most that I had so much fun creating is we had uh, the secret ingredient they gave us was, uh, they gave us two secret ingredients. They gave, we had to incorporate marshmallow peeps. I don't know if you're familiar with those. It's like a marshmallow, looks like little chicks. They're sold at Easter um, and jelly beans. So the idea was how are you going to, you know, to provide confectioner makers, like the opportunity to create something out of this rework, something, you know, that in other words, peeps that, weren't good don't meet quality control because they were deformed or something like that nothing wrong with them food safety wise or taste wise just they didn't meet all the other appearances or you know jelly beans that were broken or stuff like that so we had to come up with things and, uh, and that was our challenge the iron confectioner thing 
And so the one I did was I came up with a, uh, a sushi, um, a can sushi candy. And so what I did was I took uh, dark chocolate and combined it with corn syrup and it becomes what we call chocolate leather so that it's pliable and you can shape it like modeling clay. And I took uh, tin foil and crumpled it up and then smoothed it out. And I rolled the dark chocolate out on the shiny side of the tin foil. So now it looked like nori, which is the, the black seaweed part that goes around the rolls, right? The, the sea rolls. And so then I took the, um, the marshmallow peeps and I made the equivalent of Rice Krispie squares with some Rice Krispies and uh, flattened that out and put it on top of that my nori, my chocolate, right? And I took the, um, the jelly beans and crushed them all up and mixed them with uh, white chocolate together with some uh, wasabi powder um, in the white chocolate. And then mixed all, put all that in the center and then rolled it all up like a little California roll. Um, and then I took white chocolate and, and colored it pink and put wasabi, uh, ginger powder into the, the white chocolate and made little pink curls of white chocolate that was like the pickled ginger you get with sushi and glued that on top of, of each slice and did all that in one hour. Right? Um, and it was a lot of fun and it looked fantastic because I had planned to do something like that. I didn't really know what the secret ingredients were but I wanted to come up with something like that. And I actually brought sushi boards and chopsticks with me. Um, so I had, I presented it on a sushi board and everything. And so it looked, it looked beautiful. It looked fantastic. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can't remember the address for my Flickr page. Um, yeah, but if you look up my name or Mr. Pastry on Flickr, uh, F-L-I-C-K-R, um, I have a lot of public photos there and the, the iron confectioner photos should be there as well. Um, they're from a number of years ago, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, we're just kind of in a, in a waiting stage because I, I didn't time my gabbing quite perfectly this Not time. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, going to... Time to talk. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. You didn't get to sample any of the bread. Um, did you want some of the bread? Did they eat it all, Chef? No, they left you a little piece here. Beautiful. <laughs> 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 I love the cream. Of, I love the uh, cream of wheat. That is genius, sir. Because I always found that uh, cornmeal too crunchy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's my thing. I, I find the corn mills a bit crunchy. Oh yeah, this is really nice. Wow, eh? Wow. You could put prosciutto and brie on that and eat it for lunch. Can you remember the smell of the bread? No, I, I never remember making bread with her. I remember making pita with her. Oh, yeah. Maybe she might. Mm -hmm. <laughs> pita, that's an art too. Yeah. We're doing four cent bread on, on Thursday. I'm demoing four cent bread. But you can, you can also taste with that the, the slight sourness that is there. It's not super strong, it's not overly pungent. What gives it the open cell structure mostly is the high hydration, right? And the slow fermentation process is what helps gives it, gives all the big bubbles and, and things like that. So while we are, um, I just want to wait a little bit longer before I start mixing this to give it a chance, but I'm going to cut up the baguette we have from earlier so that you can sample that Good idea, Jeff. in case we, we don't get to it earlier. <laughs> Later, I mean, doing a did very well the breakfast course, Yeah, the crash course. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah. So you could see it's it's a little less open with the baguette. Perfect. Here's some more. Yep. I'll Jeff Donald is so hungry, we'll cut some focaccia to it. <laughs> and you can hear this has a nice crispy crust. And you'll see how, how easy and simple this comes together. Um, and with this, the big, uh, it's, it's fairly open, right? But this, this open pore structure and You'll see as I finish it, it's just lots of olive oil on top. That just has a lovely flavor. And you can dress this with like sea salt or Himalayan salt or kosher salt and uh, herbs and things like that. And it's just lovely. Sure. A plank? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a, a sheet. Right? Yeah. yeah, so if it's if they're doing a focaccia plank in a restaurant on a menu, that means that they've they've made the focaccia in, in a small little rectangular loaf of its own. Um, yeah, but not a baguette. It, it, it's quite because it's quite flat, right? So rather than a big, it could be just cut from a big sheet because I just made it in one big sheet. And that's what we're doing here with the demo, right? Or you could make them in, in individual planks. Because if you think of a plank of wood that is like say six inches wide and, and three feet long, right? You know, that, that would be a plank. So something in those types of dimensions, long, narrow dimensions, that's probably what it is, is sort of, um, I've seen like in hotel bars and stuff, they, they'll do it like a, a focaccia bread that has like roasted vegetables and meats and stuff like that on it. And then you can eat it with a fork and knife or they have it pre-cut and you just pick it up and try to put it in your mouth without having everything fall all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the our focaccia is the last one that we have to work the salt into. Oh, this is very good, I must say.
Okay. So that's that. Same thing as you saw, folding and turning, kind of, I push it in with my knuckles. And you can see when it doesn't stick to your hands as much, and it, it's not really sticking to the bowl that much, it's easier to accomplish with threads like this, like the, the uh, baguette and the focaccia that are not such extreme high hydration. So you can see it, it reaches that cleanup really quick and makes it easy to knead in that respect. Now, as we go back to the sourdough, starting to rise a little bit. And we're going to fold this as the, the term that is used. And to do that, we want to have some water handy because this is a very high hydration, very sticky dough. So you want to dip your hands in cold in water. And so you grab some of the dough and you pull it up and pull it over on top. Then turn the bowl, you know, 90 degrees. Doesn't matter whether you turn it that way 90 degrees or this way 90 degrees, just keep turning in the same direction all the time. Right. Oh, another good trick, right? Remember that with a 90 degree turn of the bowl. Pull it up and fold it over. Dip your hands again. So with a wet dough, you want to keep your hands wet so that it won't stick. Right? Turn again, fold it up and over and turn again and fold it up and over. And so now we have to let this go for another 30 minutes and come back and do the same thing again. Baguette dough is not quite ready. <laughs> you guys are going to be comfortable making it to tie in as your guidance teacher, do we? Okay. Oh, chef. <laughs> Delicious, chef. Delicious, just that right amount of salt. These are actually really fun breads to do. Um, because like I said in the beginning, you, you get hooked on it and then you want to try different different ratios of different things. Um, There's a bakery at Kello. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so, like we were talking about the how often to feed the, the starter, for example. Um, there's a bakery I became aware of in California. And what they do is they feed their starters every 12 hours. They feed the sours because they find that that produces just the right amount of yeast that they want with just the right amount of lactic acid so that it's mellow and not too sour. And it gives them just the right notes that they want. So, you know, your feeding schedule is a big part of what will produce that. You could feed every two days. Like you could refrigerate and feed, for example, every two or three days. And it will be slower fermentation process, but it will also produce more lactic, uh, more uh, acetic acid. So it will become more sour, more pungent. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just depends on what it is you're targeting. Right, you know, like if you want a sourdough pancake, um, there's there's other reasons why a sourdough pancake is attractive. It's not just because of making that sourdough flavor, but the thing is that the acid that you're producing in a sour is whether it's acetic or lactic, but especially like lactic acid, the way it reacts is it reacts with baking soda. So baking soda alone does nothing as a chemical leavener. It needs an acid and moisture to react to, and then the heat expands those gas bubbles that it produces, right? 
So if you're making a pancake with sourdough and baking soda, the acid is what reacts with the soda to give you the leavening of your pancake. Um, just like I, I also, I played around with, I love crumpets. Right? I, li I, like, I like eating crumpets and I like making them too. Right? It's, uh, crumpets are actually not baked in an oven. They're, they're baked on a griddle right? in, a, in a crumpet ring. Um, and so they're a, a you, you, it's a combination of yeast dough, but again, you let that yeast dough ferment for a while so that it produces some sour to act, help activate the soda that you have and that you add to the, to the crumpet because crumpets have like these telltale holes all across the top. Um, and, you know, kind of they're cooked mostly just in the bottom on, on the griddle. Not quite, yeah, but uh, because it's cooked strictly on the griddle. Um, I'll have to make some from, see if I get time to make it before we hit our trip. Right? Um, and so what, I, I had some kombucha that went sour. Uh, and so I thought, well, what else could I try this using the strawberry kombucha for? And so I used the strawberry kombucha as my liquid in the crumpet and for the acid. And it, worked, it left a very slight strawberry flavor, it was very mild, not strong at all but it worked perfectly as far as the acid goes. It made, made them bubble really nice and I had really nice crumpets making that. Right? And I see where they, you know, the pineapple, uh, grapes, I think yeah. uh, they do the book, they got the grapes in there. Yeah, but that, but that is also in terms of using it for starters. That's for a different reason though. Right. Um, so for um, pineapple works really well. If you, you want to make sure though, that if you're using pineapple, that it is not pasteurized, so that it's not a juice in a can or something like that. Best thing is to have fresh pineapple and, and crush it and strain it and juice it, right? Um, or you can use grapes, grapes. is the other one. And the reason is, is for the, the enzymes that are naturally there in those fruits. Um, the pine the grapes, you have to cut like right, chef, you yeah. can't have the whole. Yeah, you have to cut, you have to crush them up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those enzymes will, that's why like, like grapes work so well for ferment to make wine is because all you have to do is put a bunch of grapes and, and heat them up a little bit and then they'll start fermenting because the yeast that's naturally in the air, you don't have to add much and they have the enzymes there to break down the sugars in the grape and the yeast. Right? So you, you can take advantage of those enzymes and make it a sour as well and make it a starter. You only do it in the beginning, just to, to initially to initiate the starter, to get it going, right? Um, and then similar with the pineapple juice. And um, Peter Reinhardt's book, uh, The Bread Baker's Apprentice, he recommends pineapple juice, right? Um, in, in his starter too. Uh, so things like that. Kiwi might work as well, but the downside with kiwi, it's so high in citric acid that your, your pH is drops too low. So that's why pineapple and grapes work better because they're not as acidic um, and they, they, the enzyme will just help break down all the starches to feed the yeast, right? And help give you a good starter that way. And this is why we say this is a science, right? Don't get misleaded. There's all kinds of science and you probably understand the science. It's just not as, uh, we don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. there, and then Chef Mark is some of the jobs that are available. Sure, I know Chef Todd is doing uh, uh, culinary uh, culinary research chef or well, culinary jobs in the culinary. Mm -hmm. I forget the mm -hmm. exact name of the class. But oh, I see. Okay, yep. so, uh, career readiness. Career readiness, yeah. exactly. So him talking about that, I'm sure that Chef Todd. If I don't think of it, it's not a side of the industry. Yeah, I mean, I when when I was at ADM, I, I had a very fortunate role in a lot of the things that I got to do at certain points because um, when um, as I, I got to know colleagues in the U.S. first before the the offer ever was even a thought. Right? And um, the, at that time, uh, ADM had a research chef in, in a culinary center they had just built. Um, and the research chef worked in the protein group. Now, protein being meat, of course, but, but 
what they were doing, a big part of what they were using was soy proteins to extend meat, particularly for lower income uh, uh, nations and things like in South America and stuff like that to make it to no as a nutrient to, to provide sufficient nutrition as far as protein goes, but lower the cost. Right? Um, because soy protein is just so much less expensive than meat, especially in a place like uh, Brazil or Venezuela. Or, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so um, the chef they had working uh, as research chef there, I, I got to know him briefly a little bit. And uh, he used to be one of the chefs at the White House um, during the Clinton and the Reagan administrations. Um, and not the head chef, but he was a chef there. You have to, you have to observe in the military, you have to have military clearance. Yeah, he was in the Navy. Um, I think he was a great, great chef. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't head chef. He was just one of the, the chefs there, right? right? And so, um, and I was looking forward to working with him, but when I got transferred down there, he had already left the company. And there was another young fellow there who was now the research chef. And I worked with him a bit. And so part of what we would do as research chefs, besides just uh, research projects or you know, um, app product development and things like that, is we do certain concept development. And sometimes that was in the form of um, the CEO is coming to meet uh, the CEO of another company and they want lunch made with our ingredients in it. Um, and so then we would have to come up with things to do nice plated lunches and then things like that that incorporated our ingredients. And, and that's right up my alley because I like being creative and exploring different ideas. Right? And I'll come back to that in just a second. And Chef, you mentioned this morning, Bertan Andreas. Yes. Yeah. Bertan Andreas from uh, El Bole, top restaurant in the world for many years. He would close down for six months. Six months, yeah. And hire all these scientists to come in. Oh, no, so, it was the same chefs. Oh, same chef. Yeah. No, that was his. Oh, that was his team. Yeah. 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 Well, they, they would work like scientists. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. They yeah. Would, uh, the example I use is the warm gelatin. Like, how do we serve for Dan and Dre and say to these guys, this is what I want to do. I want one of my dishes is going to serve warm jello. How do I serve jello warm? You know what's going to happen to jello. And they want to but he wanted to figure out how to do this and serve it warm. So that's the kind of things they would work on. And molecular cuisine, the science is very prolific. It's right there in front of you. It's part of the cuisine itself that the science deconstructs. Right? Do, do is there a molecular astronomy course within that? I don't one? believe you guys do molecular astronomy. Oh. No, but there is, a, and this is an interesting fact, there is a guy at the university, and he's a molecular scientist. And uh, last year, it sort of put, I think it's a good connection here. And put sort of things together that he wanted to start to teach uh -huh. uh, to molecular molecular food mm -hmm. to culinary students. And I don't think it ever got off the ground. I was kind of half uh, invited to go and, and meet. Yeah, and, and, and some of it's not, well, I'll, I'll circle back to that a bit, but some of it's not that science crazy terrific as you might think, right? It's just Heston Blumenthal from the Fat Duck started yeah, this whole thing. And um, and, and even he and uh, 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 Adrian Charan, uh, you know, the El Boule chef, they, they hate the term of molecular astronomy. To them, it's just astronomy, right? Astronomy. It's food, right? Um, and, um, but, uh, but yeah, so I got to do a lot of things like that. And so then Eric, who was the chef, he, he left the company. And so then they still wanted to do lunches, but they didn't want to hire a new chef. So they kind of asked me if I could do it on my own. Because all I was doing was just dessert at that point, right? Um, and so I got to do a lot of fun different things. And um, one of the meals, I'll, uh, you know, I recall, uh, I'll detail here to, to fill some more time before I get back to this, is um, we had the people from uh, Miller Coors in, um, you know, people produce Coors Light and, and uh, a bunch of different beers like that. And so um, I, I, I had some fun with it, right? Um, and so uh, I did a salad um, and, and I call it uh, reds and greens. And basically it was a Boston bib lettuce and with some um, julienne uh, red delicious apples. And uh, I made a, a twill, uh, you, know, you know what twills are like the, the cookie, but I did savory twill that was like an arch that sat on the plate like the Arch of St. Louis, because yeah. that's where 
uh, Budweiser is from originally, which is part of their, their company as well. Um, and, uh, and so, and then I made a dressing using uh, red apple rail, or the, the red apple ale, right? Um, using that in the dressing and all you know, so the your red, only greens, right? So, um, so I used their beer in the dressing. And then I also had fiber salt, which is a soluble corn fiber in the dressing. So they were getting extra fiber that way too. Uh, and it's, it's flavorless, and, but it gives you a di good di uh, dietary fiber. Right? Um, and so, and then as a, as a main course, I called it uh, tall, dark and delicious. And um, <laughs> so I, I took a pork shoulder and braised it with a, a dark beer. I can't even remember the name of it now, but it was one of their dark beers. And, and so I braised it with that and, and uh, did, you know, uh, like Duchess potatoes and a couple things on, on the side and I had some fun with it. And um, then I'm trying to remember the dessert now. Um, it was something that was semi-frozen, um, but it was again, using some of their beer in the dessert and stuff like that too. And had lots of fun with these things on, uh, yeah, and, and I, I, I like playing around with the different ideas. I mean, for the research up association, I did a dessert for the lunch of 600 people one time where um, I incorporated different colored sauces and everything. So the whole theme was we were in Atlanta where that's the headquarters for uh, NASCAR racing, right? And so, uh, and so the only thing that was local really in the area was this Scoopernong grape, which is a very sweet grape that they make a wine of there. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll make that. And then I'll, what am I gonna do? How, how can I do NASCAR theme? So I thought, okay, I'll do different color sauces on the plates, kind of with, with chocolate sauce underneath that looks like, you know, the colorful race cars running you know, on, the, on the track, right? And so then I did a layered cake, uh, with like a chocolate cake, a red velvet cake with um, layers of chocolate mousse with uh, tomato and basil in it and, and uh, uh, rat frozen raspberry mixed throughout, right? So that it looked like people sitting in the stand because I cut it on an angle. Um, so we had these lines of chocolate cake and, and so that was kind of the stand. And then I made a, just like a, 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 a sabayon type sauce out of the, Scoopernong that went on the plate. And then we had like a Simplot was the sponsor. Simplot had these square apple parts that we put on the side, and that was kind of like pit gold, right? So the whole plate was like a, a NASCAR track kind of idea, right? So that's fun with that. Um, I did one for ADM for the for the big wigs upstairs for a big um, meal presentation. We did once where um, it was all in the, it was entertaining some, some um, uh, stockbrokers from, from Wall Street. And uh, this the, at that time, ADM had just bought a flavor company called uh, Wild, um, Wild Ingredients. And their main logo color is green and ADM's main logo color is blue. So I wanted to come up with something that represented these colors. And this is more along where, where I mean it's molecular gastronomy, but it's not really highly unusual, right? It's not nothing that is, is you're working with dangerous chemicals or, or things like that, right? So it was just, I was playing with people's senses, um, what you see and what you taste, okay? So I took um, avocado, which is very bland, but it's nice and green, right? And I took avocado, and I flavored it with raspberry. And because raspberry flavor has no color to it. It's just, it's just, you know, it's just the natural chemicals extracted from the raspberry. And so, but made that whole thing. So I made a, a vanilla sauce, essentially a creme anglaise, but instead of using cream and milk, I used pureed avocado, flavored it with raspberry. And I cast that into these little um, domes, little like a silicone mold and froze it. And then after it was frozen, uh, and so the creme anglaise is, of course, fluid, right? It's, it's kind of a thick fluid, right? And, um, and so after it was frozen, then I took a, a white chocolate coating and thinned it out with uh, palm fat, which is like fat that ADM uses, like a hard fat, and I colored it blue. And so then I airbrushed it with, a, with an airbrush. So by thinning it out, it allows me to airbrush it. 
and it allows me to get a coating of fat on there all the way around after I take them out of the mold that is like barely a millimeter thick. Okay, so it's really thin, completely coated. So it's enough to just hold the creme anglaise in there so that it can't go anywhere. Right? And so we put that on the plate and surround it with some red uh, areoles of, of uh, pomegranate. And then I made a spuma of foam out of raspberry juice and uh, lecithin, which helps make it foam nicely. And I flavored that with spearmint, the spearmint oil, right? And so I put the foam around it on the plate so that then when they cracked the, the dome, the, the, the green creme anglaise came out from the blue dome with this red foam that tasted like spearmint and the green stuff that tasted like raspberry, right? Um, so it was really cool. It was, it was fun. And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, Adrian Ferrara likes to do or Ferran, yeah. Um, I also had the opportunity not once, but actually twice, if I may brag. Um, I've had dinner, the, I've had the, the tasting menu at Osteria Francescana in, uh, in um, Modena, Italy, uh, which uh, for three years in a row, I think it was the number one restaurant in the world on the San Pellegrino list, right? Yes. Um, and so they would, it's a 12 course tasting menu with uh, about six or seven different wines that are paired with it. And they explain everything and all that. And it's uh, $450 US per person. Um, and, and it was, I'd highly recommend it if you can get in. We were lucky because I went with us caught with the college. Uh, and so the college was able to, to get that organized through a local school in Italy that we were partnering. Right, a language uh, school. Yeah, right? you, don't, you don't just call it. You don't just call up Osteria for gone and say, I'm coming with 30 people. <laughs> Actually, they, the second time we went, they wouldn't let us uh, bring all 30 in at once. We had to go on to 15, 15, two different nights. Because, right? uh, uh, but, but they give us a tour of the kitchen and everything. I mean, uh, the kitchen's gorgeous. It's small, it's tiny. It's, it's like maybe from there to here and from there to here, right? Um, and, but, but that's only the main kitchen where they do service. All of the other prep kitchens are in other buildings down the alley, yeah. right? Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an amazing place, right? Yeah. Um, and how long did that menu last? How many, to eat it, you mean? Um, somewhat seasonal. I mean, they, when we went the second year, a lot of the things on, were still on the same menu. Yeah. Um, he doesn't change as often as Ferran did, you know, um, but his also his whole theme is um, is uh, is all about um, taking traditional Italian dishes and giving them a modern presentation and things like that. Um, one of the ones that he is uh, very famous for is um, uh, the crunchy part of the lasagna, um, and so in in Italian homes. The, the corner of the like, so lasagna is baked in a, in a big dish usually when they, they make it in a household and, and you know, when, when mama would used to make it kind of, right? And, um, and, uh, and all, everybody wants the corners, the, the, the edges where it's nice and crunchy. They want that crunchy part of the lasagna is always so sought after. Um, and then the ragu is of course the sauce that goes in is, is like, you know, it has to be just like what grandma used to make, right? And so he, he came up with a ragu that to him satisfied what, and what he felt locals too, was that it was a real traditional Italian ragu, right, a meat sauce, um, it was just beautiful. And so and to do the, the crunchy part of the lasagna is what they will do is they, they take pasta and they boil the pasta and cook it. And then after it's cooked, they put it in uh, like a thermal mix. They, they actually use a hot mix. Yeah. And they put it in there and puree it and cook it further to evaporate some of the water out of it. And then they take that paste and they sheet it out and, and roll it out and cut it into pieces. And then they take those pieces and they deep fry them. Right. Yeah. So they kind of blow up and they get really crunchy. right? And then they would layer that with the ragu and, and put a little bit of Parmesan on top and, and torch it and that's it. right? Um, and one of the dishes we did was Parmesan five ways. They had five different ways of prepar preparing Parmesan from cold to hot, 
Uh, one was a foam, one was like a cream and all this. And, and there were different five different ages of Parmesan that they used as well. So it's very creative and interesting dishes. Yeah. It was, it, yeah. And the plating to the butter, Chef Adam, when you look at his plates, like they are absolutely, they are works of art. Uh, I showed uh, Chef Adam, you see his plates, the, the, yep. the meal we sent, uh, uh, our Canadian team sent Chef Adam a meal uh, on, on uh, Valentine's Day and said, see what you can do. And it just blew us away, uh, the presentation Adam came up with, Chef Adam came up with in line. Really, it was that night, and it was bang, 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 bang. Just incredible. So very creative place. But I digress. Thanks. So we're back to, we're back so, to yeah, the dough. Yeah, here's, here's the baguette dough. And in the interest of time, uh, usually this, was, this will get folded. You, you, you continue stretching and folding a couple more times. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to take it now and I'm going to uh, divide it and shape it for you. So you've had a chance to sample it. At least you can also get to see how it is shaped we how we finish it last night same pole am i correct in saying that yep same pole remember the 90 degree turn pole 90 degree turn on the wall we did the same thing the second time of this so i make them about 300 grams each and so now what we're doing is we're going to roll them up so uh the easiest way to do this as a beginner is you want to tuck it, you know, and you're trying to make the seam on the bottom, right? So you pull it towards yourself and then roll it forward and pull it towards yourself and pull it forward and towards yourself. And you see how it's getting round and it's getting tension, right? Okay. So that what we're doing is we're, we're creating this seam. So if you imagine what I'm doing is I'm pulling it each time and stretching it down so that it gets a seam on the bottom. So I'm doing that by pulling it towards me and then pushing it forward so that now I'm pulling this part towards me. And so now as I pull it forward, I'm putting that on the side. You see, it's like a 90 degree turn again, pull it towards me. And, and so when I do that as a baker, I'm doing that with one hand like this. So you get that tension on there so that it has life. So I start off by just folding it in, flipping it over, and then pull it towards yourself and pull it towards yourself and pull it towards yourself. So each time turning it just a little bit, pressing down and pulling it so that you're tucking in underneath, right? And when you've done this for about maybe 60 to 100 balls, you'll get the, the good feeling for it. And then After you can just- yeah. Yep. And after 45 years, you can start to do it one-handed like that. Right? It's beautiful, isn't it? That little fold, I love it. And so now this would usually need to... You want a trolley there, brother, for that? You got one? Oh, got her hand. So this should usually rest for about a good 10 minutes, but we're just gonna go ahead so that I can show you some of the molding. Um, and so you flip it over now so that the seam is facing up, okay? And from the top down to the middle, you can use your fingertips to press it in, or I like to use the ball of my hand, okay? And then I, I like to turn it over, flip it to the middle again, and then flip it down to the middle again and flip it all the way over to close it up. And then press on it firmly, but not really rough and roll it with your hands moving towards the outside at the same time so that you're stretching it, you're pressing outward and down at the same time. And don't try to get the full length. You're just doing this the first time like that. So then you set it aside to rest for a little bit and go on to the next one. Just that will shrink up, right? So it'll pull together because because I've I've put so much tension in it. It'll pull together a little bit. And so now we do this one.
in a way what makes it easier sometimes if you're doing five or 10 of these is that way by the time you get to the last one, the first one has had enough rest, you can just keep going, right? You don't have to wait for it much. Right? Then it's just gonna give that a moment. And I'm going to put some pan release guys, on here. We went to about 11.30. You guys took us. Yeah, we went to about 11, 11 20 today. So you guys good for 20 after 3? Did you ask that earlier? I did mention it to them you earlier, yeah. You've got that yeah. Kind of work or you've got that something on the go that time will be accomplishing that. How are you calling? Oh, you're good? Yeah. So after this has had a little bit of rest, it's better to leave it a little bit longer, maybe covered with some plastic or a, or a towel, just so because like, especially in here, there's a lot of air movement and you may not feel the breeze as much, but the dough certainly feels it, right? And if you don't have it covered, at least with a towel, it'll dry out and skin over really bad. And that skin won't come back, right? It's dead, right? Um, and that, 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 that really keeps it from rising and uh, yeah, properly. exactly. Yeah, and it, it'll it'll look ugly and look ugly. be a hard crust. Yep. Um, and so now we want to take it and again, seam side up. And so as I am flattening it, I'm pulling it. I'm stretching it slightly. Yeah. So again, the same thing as I'm doing, folding it over here. I'm folding it and just ever so slightly stretching it. And applying some pressure and tension as I roll it out, try to get the thickness as even as possible and getting it kind of the length of the pan. And so there's my seam. And so you wanna kind of lay your fingers across the seam as you pick it up and flip it over, that helps you get the seam nice and straight down into the pan. Because if the seam is on the side or anything like that, it'll burst open and then it, it won't look nice. Yeah, it's the weakest spot in that respect. Wash, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and some breads, there are breads like the Dewey wash. Yeah, the, the bread. Well, usually if they're rich breads. If they're rich breads, yeah. okay. Um, lean, they're breads, they're you they're 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 lean breads, you don't. Lean breads is is steam or water. Uh, and rich breads, yes, you would. You, can do the, you apply the egg wash to help give it browning. It's a yeah. Maillard reaction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, well, last month was Black History Month, but um, that's that's one of the things is often, especially people in Illinois, ironically, don't don't often realize that the the person who discovered the Maillard reaction was a guy named Maillard, and he was from the University of Illinois in uh, Champaign, Illinois, and he was an African American, right? Um, so there's you know it's funny how women and African Americans don't get enough credit for the discoveries and things that they've they've you know given us throughout history. It's it's really I'm amazing. Radio, uh, uh, radioactive uh, radioactive uh, no. So I'm gonna put this one in the proofer for a while. Yeah, I'm going to give our sour one more fold before I uh, go to the. Sour ciabatta. No, the ciabatta is last. That's yeah. That's gonna. I'm gonna get put that in the oven and that.
Oh, Chef, your Norton subscription ended. Why is that? Very annoying. Stay protected. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, well, Gatorade is mostly dextrose, so it's a simple sugar. Um, so it's it, it's easy for the yeast to ferment. Um, so yeah, you could, if you didn't have any sugar around, you could put some Gatorade in, it wouldn't hurt it, right? Um, uh, there's other minerals and things in, in Gatorade that are there for athletes to help um, replenish electrolytes and stuff like that. They don't, they don't matter to the yeast or anything really much at all, right? Yeah, yeah, so you have a cool color. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, and things like that come and go. Um, it's like there was, there was a guy, I can't remember where, I might have been in New York, and they, they came up with a, a rainbow bagel, and where they, they colored their bagel dough, several pieces of dough, different colors, and then twisted them all together, and then twisted that into a bagel, so it was this, it was this big twisted bagel that was multicolored, and they called it a rainbow bagel, and it hit social media somehow, and then people started lining up for them like crazy, and they smartly, so they just said, they're only making whatever it was, 300 a day, and that's it. And once they're gone, they're gone, right? Um, because eventually the fad wears out, right? Um, you know, and it's just like uh, Dominic Ansel, he's the one who created the croissant, the, the cronut, I mean. So he wisely, he, what he did is he patented it so that he still only makes a few hundred a day. He hasn't expanded his business or anything like that. But anybody who wants to make a, a croissant donut like his and call it a cronut, they have to pay him royalties. So, yeah, you can. Yeah, the process. Yeah. 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 You can. Not the recipe, the process. The process. Yeah. yeah. Certain, uh, you know, the formula you can, you can uh, patent too. Yeah. Just uh, like, um, uh, General Mills has the brownie patented. They're um, the uh, the brownie the, the brownie mix in the box. Yeah. You know, it's patented. Yeah. So the Especially about what they have mostly patented is the process of how they add corn syrup to the mix. Um, and it's a very long story how I discovered this. It was surely by accident, but uh, uh, it's it, it's fun and interesting. Right? Uh -huh. So I've stretched every the same again for the sourdough, and and I, I kind of like the when I'm done stretching, I kind of like to put the seam on the bottom. It doesn't really matter a whole lot. I just feel like it looks better and it grows better and, and stuff like that. Right? I know before you came, you didn't need any. And people were like, I can't be any good. So they were drawing more and they made better and you need to add any. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the 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 egg does a, a. You can some of these mixes. You could theoretically cook it without an egg in it. The the egg helps with leavening, uh, emulsification, because the eggs naturally expand. And of course, they, they bind, right? So they're a liquefier in the beginning in the mixing stage, and then they're a stabilizer when it comes to the baking stage, right? So the, the egg is the one ingredient that has a yeah a structuring, yeah. So that that's it's the one ingredient that kind of has a, a dual role in that way, right? Whereas flour, sugar, things like that, they're structurants, right? They they're always forming structure, right? Um, so remember, we talked about the ingredients, the one ingredient. Did some of that, some of the virus, some of the moisture. Remember that in our last last week? We were talking about budget. 
the same in this, this process. So that 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 be that understanding of what students do continues right with this training program, right? Yeah. And it's it's key. I mean, those foundation principles, I mean, the the things that for me in my 45 year career, the things I learned in the first three and a half years of my apprenticeship, those foundations, they are what carried me through all the time. That was it, it always, no matter how complex the science around it became of what we were working, the underlying understanding, the underlying foundation principles is what allows you or helps you to work with it and understand it best, right? Um, like when it comes, you guys are, I've heard you're working with puff pastry, right? And I was telling this a little bit with the other class. I mean, I worked on a research project uh, with researchers where we were working with uh, a large company who wanted to uh, come up with a new fat blend now that they had to remove all the trans fat. Um, and so we had to make, we had the standard, the control that did have the trans fat in it, right? That's your control of what you're matching or trying to get close to. And then our oils experts, they came up with 12 different blends. And so they had to keep making these blends in the pilot plant and then run them up to me into the bakery. It was all in the same building, right? But, you know, about maybe six minute walk away, right? And, um, and I had to have the dough ready with my colleague. And so we made 13 puff pastry doughs all in one day. We have to laminate them. We have to keep track of all the time that they all have their 20 minute rest between each fold and then sheet them out, cut them into shapes, and freeze them and bake them all the next day and then do the measurements and things like that. So there again, as much as it was very fine tuned, being very precise as far as consistent and regular, as far as the research goes, but having that understanding, that skill of how to sheet the dough out, to roll it, whether it be on a machine or by hand, doesn't make any difference at that point. It's the same principle and keep that whole process moving nice and smooth is having those skills. The fat scientist knows everything he knows about fat, but he, he couldn't begin to make puff pastry because does, he's not skilled in the art of, right? As they say in patents. Right? Yeah. Right. So that's interesting, right? So, so that is that other opportunity in the career to say, okay, just the scientist has skills to get you here, but beyond that, you can't make a taste to it. Resentments or a paint process. So that's where the culinary comes in. So it's a very, uh, it's, it's a career that I have a lot of. It's a lot of opportunities, yeah. And the, the, the discipline of, of science tends to be um, the boring part is trying to keep it all the same. Okay. And at the same time, I find that very to me, interesting and exciting. And that's probably my German heritage because I like it when everything fits nicely in its little box, okay? My wife does not. My wife likes to have everything out on the counter. Well, <laughs> and I'm kind of in the middle there. <laughs> Yes, I mean, and, and we, we also like to latch onto the things that suit us, what make, just gives us a good excuse to be the way we want to be, right? I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it's more of that. So, um, uh, so to prepare for the, we're, uh, what they're calling ciabatta in the book is we're, we're making like a big slab or plank of focaccia. And so I've, I've dressed the, the tray either with cornmeal or in this case with the, the wheat hearts, the wheatlets. And so I flattened it out upside down to get it as close to the size of the tray as I can. And so now I will pick it up and flip it right side up onto the tray and finish stretching that out to get it to fill nicely. And chef is going to top me up with a little more olive oil. I forgot, sorry. Yes, you, we're going to top it with just olive oil, like the one that you sampled already. Um, but you can put all kinds of different herbs, olives, uh, 
sun-dried tomatoes or even just sliced heirloom tomatoes. Uh, if you look on Pinterest or YouTube, you could find all kinds of beautiful decorative focaccia where they look like works of art. They look like paintings, the way they've arranged all the different vegetables and fruits. They're just, they're just amazing, right? Um, or another one is the, the oil that you choose that. Maybe yeah. You're already getting there some fresh time. Oh, yeah. I, I have uh, through, through Research Chef Association, I, and, and see networking, we mentioned networking earlier. How I even ended up with my job at um, Maple Leaf Mills was through networking, um, was because I was friends with a lady uh, through the Pastry Chefs Guild who had been looking for work um, but found the job that she was happy with at the time. And, um, and so she had been talking to multiple recruiting agencies. That agency had, uh, one agency had called her again and she said, no, I'm happy with what I got, but you might want to talk to this guy. He might be interested, right? And, and just because of that, that's how, you know, that's what happened 25 years ago or 26 now, right? And, and Mark yeah. and I, the reason he's here is, well, it's serendipity tell you this story. I thought yep. it was somebody else. Now a mutual friend, Noreen, thought, or Rory, thought that we worked together to help we were actually three years apart. So we kind of connected that way. But that networking, you know, talk about that kind of problem, it's, it's vital in this business. If you screw him, you've screwed yourself with me and probably everybody he knows. If you screw yourself with me, if you screw with me, you screw everyone. You screw your chance of any chef that I know. That's just the that's the nature of it. You'll get into this with uh, what is it again? Career. Okay, if you want, yeah, it's for the first year. All right. But, but yeah, it's 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 really about you know you you know and not not so much on the negative side, you know, you don't, don't necessarily want to mess, but focus on messing up. But it's the opportunity to meet people and maximize opportunities and and you know if you're uh it's like i always say like you know um you catch more flies than honey than you will with with vinegar right um and and yet yeah some people will say well yeah and they'll fly to shit too right but you know i mean usually still honey wins no matter what right um yes and um but you know like but but you know speaking of the infused oil when i was at an rca conference through a mutual friend, another chef that I know in California, who's of German heritage is how we got to know each other, which we met each other through another friend as well before, but he's like, oh, you should come with us for dinner tonight um, and, and meet these guys. I'll, I'll tell them you're coming. Okay. And so we, we went to dinner. It was this beautiful dinner in Denver. And um, so the, the, the thing is, it was the, the father and son team of Garlic King as one of the largest garlic producers in California, right? And so I needed some garlic for uh, an event I was doing at ADM. And I said, hey, you know, can you, can you send me some samples of some garlic? I'd like some nice roasted garlic. They sent me like black garlic and roasted garlic and this thing, and like some nice roasted garlic infused in the oil. It's just, oh, it's just, it's lovely, right? And, and so, yeah, you never know who you get to meet and all the things you get to play with, right? I mean, um, I got to know people at ADM a lot just through happen sense, through serendipity or things like that. And one fellow, um, and, and people tend to remember me for some reason, right? And um, and must be my my goofy stuff or something, right? And but this this fellow remembered me, and he's now VP at a company that does a specialty chickpea flour. And he posted on LinkedIn about um, his technicians having developed this gluten free bread made with their chickpea flour. And I posted a comment and, and just saying, like, it looks really good. I'd love to hear more about it, right? And he remembered me. And so he messaged me and he says, I'm going to have my R&D chef call you and we're sending you samples. Right? So, you know, just they sent me samples all the way to Nova Scotia um, just to play with it, just, just to see what I come up with to share ideas with them and things like that. And I talked with his, his R&D chef and, and her assistant for almost an hour. On, on a, a call, right? Just, just chit chatting, sharing ideas. And so, and that's all networking. And it's, you know, you don't, you just be yourself and just get to know people, right? And um, be yourself. And, and I always just think of like, I'm half in the back of my head thinking about how can I help this person? What can I offer you? What can I do 
that would help you. And it doesn't have to be in this moment. It's just listening to what they're saying, what they're doing, and what's important to them. Um, just like when Donald and I met, um, when we first chatted online, it was, you know, our common thing was the Celtic Lodge, the Celtic Lodge, the heyday, yada, yada, yada. And then he started mentioning that he was working, doing stuff for the farmer's market. And uh, if, if I could come and do a demo or some pastries or something, right? So I latched on to pastries. So I went and go see the place and stuff. And we talked a bit. So I thought, yeah, for what they're doing, let's see if people will buy croissants. I don't know. Maybe they won't like croissants here at all, right? Who knows? So I cautiously made what was about three dozen croissants. Right? Yeah. Made about three dozen croissants. And they were all sold by 11 o'clock. They were gone, yeah. right? <laughs> so, um, and so now we're making usually about, uh, so I make about, uh, I make about two and a half times five. So 12 and a half to 14 dozen every week. Right? Um, it's just the that's just the croissants. And, and then. Apple, I tell you, this apple turn. Yeah, I can't even describe Yeah, our, our, our. I'm going to actually go over in that one. I'm just going around here because there's less people. Oh, I forgot my mask again. I'm sorry. Let me go this way. Yeah. I'll go get my mask. So if you ever uh, have never need a match, all people give them out. Right at the door. Right? So uh and I and then uh, I know that you're ready to try one mask to work to make people drop the mask. But anyway, I I'm getting the lights out again. You know, great. I have the opposite problem. Those are this. I got to find the mask. There's some mask I just had. Oh, yeah. The chef is going to bring you up. Like I said, guys, we're going to get this in the oven. And let's see if we can put this around the wall. We can try it coming up. It's all up to you all. If you want to volunteer or want to change your best time on that as well. You, but, uh, Last one I'm going to show you at least the shaping quickly we'll is the sourdough. Yeah. yeah we'll get those shapes, and that's up to you guys what you want to do. Okay? You've seen the chia bada. I'm sorry. You've seen the pasta. You've seen the sourdough coming beginning to end. You've seen the French the uh, baguette. You've got to put it in here. You've seen that beginning to end by the end product. So you've pretty well covered it all. We get all our, our own comps here. So it's up to you if you want to see what happens. Be a little seed coming in, okay? Let us let us let's shape the sourdough and let's get the back end to the oven and that's your call, all right? Okay, so I like to use um, dark rye flour in the banatons. Um, I've been trying to do them lately without the the cloth liner in it to get more of the the ribbed pattern from the uh, from the basket, um, and so. All I do is I spray it very, mist it very lightly with water. And then we sprinkle the rye flour in here. And so it's, it's just like, uh, if you're greasing and, and flouring a, a cake pan, you know, just rotate it around, knock off some of the excess so that there's a nice coating of flour everywhere. And you can do this with white flour too. I just prefer to use rye because it's, uh, it's more visible as a, a pattern or design on top afterwards. 
and it's a little bit finer particle size, so I find that it 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 tends to release better, so that it it um, <clears throat> because of the way it it manages the moisture coming off the dough. It's a percentage on rye flour, right? The percentage of rye to like it's not in, 100% rye you've got there. This is 100% rye. This is, 100 rye. Yeah, this is dark rye. Yep. Oh, okay. So yep. But are there different degrees of how much rye is in a... In, in a bread, in yes. A bread? In okay. a bread, yeah. Um, usually it's not 100, like only something like pumpernickel might be all rye. All rye right. um, but but even even the, you know, the, the sliced rye breads, they're probably only 40 to 50% rye really? flour. Yeah, really? uh, because rye is very has very low gluten content, right? Um, it, it doesn't hold together very well. It gets very super dense, right? And so you need high protein. That's where some of the, the like the, the high protein wheat flours are used because rye is gray already. So it doesn't make any difference in the color. And you can use that gray white flour, you know, the, the gray wheat flour, I mean, because it's not white and, it, and it, but it's high in protein. It's like 14, 15% protein. Right. And it works very well together with the rye that way. Right? And so, put some flour, drip some flour on the table. And I'm scaling these around 620 grams. Put some flour on the table. Where did my scraper go? Oh, I'm getting sloppy now. Yeah. I got another one. Gotcha. Yeah, sorry, I just. Oh, that's where it is. <laughs> I should get these out of the way. So I'm using flour dusting right now. A lot of times what, uh, some, what, what is often preferred with these types of wet doughs is to uh, spray it with Pam or something like that right but we only have three lobes so it's it's not a big deal it really is magic jeff that's about to stick your fingers right it really is perfect it's i think it's to, to try and describe it it's it's all in not grabbing it too hard right um the uh, strength in which you grab it, yeah. I'm just kind of letting it hang on to my... <laughs> what, you're saying I'm not man enough, Chef? Why is, why is a monk stronger than a man? He has bigger muscles. Because they don't know their strength. So with these, it's the same thing again, just of course the dough is very soft and sticky. And um, once I, I bring it all up to the center together and, and then bring it over and then the same idea, push it away and pull it towards you a couple of times till you see that the top looks kind of nice and smooth. 
And at this point, you then want to put it smooth side down into the Benetton, into your proofing basket. Now, if you don't have proofing baskets, what you can also do is take a, a cotton towel and line a bowl, like a stainless steel bowl or a glass bowl or something like that. The idea is to help it hold the shape, because if you just try to proof it as is, you could already see after proofing in the basket, it started to flow when I put it out. If I had just put it out to proof without any basket, it would just flow even bigger because there's not enough strength for it to push it upwards. So I fold it in from right to left and top to the middle and then fold it over on top of itself and then do that pulling it towards me and turn and pull. And I use the help of a scraper a little bit to pick it up, turn it upside down into the banneton. You see, flip that, fold inside, down the top, right? Ooh, sticky stuff. So if you get flour stuck on your hands and you have a hard time getting it off, just take some flour, uh, dough stuck on your hands, sorry. Get dough stuck on your hands, just take some flour and rub it. And then it all comes off because it helps suck up that moisture to get it off so then you can Start over. And sometimes you might need, if the, you know, if it's really sticky, just use the scraper to help you a little bit. Right? It's the same idea. See, I'm just turning it and scooping it to get it nice and smooth on top. Got my banneton ready. Scoop it up and put it in there. So now before I cover it, um, I want to dust it with uh, flour and or the cream of wheat. Um, so I like to put a little bit of the, the cream of wheat first. And then these will go in the fridge overnight as you do yours and they will then be baked the next day. You bring them out for about an hour and then put them in a hot oven. Preheat the oven. Yep. Thursday, Friday. Thursday, Friday. Season, you're awake. Good job, class. And so what I do is I use the, the liners as covers for the banneton. Huh? And I put them in the fridge just like this and just put a, a loose sheet of plastic on top. Don't just so that it doesn't get a draft, just so that it you know doesn't dry it out too much. I want it to, to breathe and dry a little bit, but I don't want it to form a hard, dry, thick crust. Right? Um, now, and you, you can, I mean, these are, of course, are uh, intended that you can you use this to line the banneton and proof with it in there, right? The only reason I like to do it without is because I like getting those lines that it produces from the from the basket, right? That's just my thing. I think it's I think it looks cool, right? It's I believe it's bamboo. Bamboo is the fastest growing. Well, it's, we think of it as a tree, but it's actually a grass. It's the fastest growing renewable wood on the planet. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, they would they plant the bamboo and then uh, tie them down to the ground. And because it grows so fast, the shoots right up through them and would, would slowly kill them. Vietnam. Yeah, 
Then we've got some more flour. Good, good. Yeah, take the bread flour, hey guys. Yeah, I'm just going to show you how to cut the baguettes. Yeah, that would be cool. See, that's could come back and do some stuff like what I have with my GoPro camera. It was really easy to do a time lapse. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I'll just put the lid on. <laughs> okay. So the, we talked about the lame and the uh, the knife already and stuff, right? Good. So they're just about ready. Almost, Chef. Yeah, let me show them. Yeah, yeah. Show them. Yeah. This is a little bit early, but uh, I'll show you because how I know it's early is like you can you, you test it by touching it with your finger. Okay. You can see how much life is left in it. Um, if it if you touch it and it doesn't come back at all, it's fully proofed. It's proofed as far as it can. If you touch it and it collapses, it's overproofed. It's and it, you won't be able to rescue it. At this point, it's a little more than half proof because you can see as I touch it, it bounces almost all the way back. Right? Okay, um, so it's it's probably almost three quarter proof. It's a, so that would be a little under normally still for baguette. We would go a little bit further, but just so that I can show you the slashing or what you guys call slashing. And it's it, an uh, industry it's often referred to as scoring, right? Remember, this um, will be on the test, the <clears throat> And so what we want to do is we don't want to cut in vertically. We want to cut in on approximately a 30 degree angle, right? And so the idea is you're cutting into the bread so that the bread can open up like this while it bakes and not just like that. Right? And so we want to cut in like nice, nice and swiftly. See, it's almost a straight cut. Three, four, five. And so, it, can it be six, chef? Ideally, what the French say is it needs to be five or seven. It needs to be an odd number and that it changes the characteristics of the crumb and the flavor of the bread. Um, I have been told that in France, it actually has to be five or seven. Five or seven. Otherwise, you can't call it a baguette. It sounds French to me. Chef. Yeah. <laughs> And so it's not cutting it across. It's not a short, it's almost straight down. You see, it's a very long angle. You see that? One, two, three, four, five. I'm just gonna help these along by spraying them. And I'm gonna put them in the hot oven. And these will only take about 20 minutes to bake. So the whole idea where baguettes came about is that um, in Europe, it's very popular to have bread for breakfast in the morning. Like in Germany, where I grew up, it was all about these little breakfast buns. People would be lined up. Hmm? No, no. <laughs> no, schnapps is in the evening. That's, that's, that's dinner. <laughs> it's supper. <laughs> Um, but you, well, you didn't. You've never been to northern Germany, right? Never been to Bavaria. So, well, Bavaria. no, Bavaria is the south. Right? Oh, Bavaria is the south. Yeah, northern Germany, like uh, where I lived in Hanover, is the, that's the north. Oh, right? Hochdeutsch. Hochdeutsch. Yeah. Hochdeutsch. Hochdeutsch, yeah. Oh. yeah. Hochdeutsch is the Swiss is a Swiss oh. slang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, well, there are different dialects. So like what, what Chef is referring to in Northern Germany is where it's considered, that's where the, um, well, ba back in olden days, that's where the aristocrats were, okay? So in Hanover, the city of Hanover was once originally the house of Hanover, and that was where the King of England resided um, until they got kind of beaten out and um, forced back to England, and then they became the House of Windsor, right? So remnants of the castle still stand in Hanover, uh, but were mostly destroyed during World War II. Um, and there's a huge royal gardens in Hanover. It's that's absolutely beautiful, oh, right? Really? Yeah. No, it's, it's a, just called the, the, the Royal Herrenhäuser Gardens, right, where the, the King's Castle used to be. Oh, okay. yeah. There's a couple of Canada, right? The Victoria, the Queen's Garden. The oh, yeah, no, but th Garden. this this is going back, like, from the 14th century. Wow. Right? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they've been, has a big moat all the way around it oh, and everything. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so um, the, the thing is, the, the high German, as they call it, the aristocrats German, is spoken in northern Germany. And then the dialects, they change as you go further south, right? Um, it says start a new video. Um, and, uh, and so uh, like, so an example, even though you don't understand German, but an example of high German with the sharp S that the Germans say in Northern Germany, it would, they would say Stefan Stolpert über Spitzenstein. Whereas in the further in the south, they'll say Stefan Stolpert über Spitzenstein, right? Um, so they slur it more, right? Um, and then there's just other idioms and things that they. Schwitze, yeah. Yeah. Schwitze is uh, so uh, Switzerland is Schweiz in German, and, and German in German is Deutsch. So Schweizer Deutsch, when you say it with the Swiss accent, is Switzerdeutsch, right? <laughs> Um, Gelle, <laughs> and everything's Gelle, yeah, 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 yeah. and um, so, yeah, so there's all those accents, and it can be, you know, different in, in that sense sometimes, right, um, and then there was something else where we started. German is so close to English, also English and I have any other language, forbidden, forbidden, you know. House is house, mouse house. is mouse, yeah, it's yeah. Right. just spelt differently. It's really, it's really uh, very, uh, I'm coming. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give it steam for a good 10 seconds or so. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's another new thing. We have one word that means like. Uh, I'm going to give it 20 minutes. Do you want to stay? Just lie there. Do you wish to stay? You know, words that mean just like we have phrases for them that would tell you one word means because it's more phrasing. So, guys, did you enjoy that? Yeah. Oh, excuse good. me. Right? Very good. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yep. Thank you. When someone has such command on the history of the uh, uh, topic and such command of the topic itself. It really makes it that much interesting. You really get a lot out of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's nice. so, thank it's you. Good. Thank you. So good job, guys. I'm glad to see your attendance. We have a lot of people coming up. And uh, 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 Josh, you're coming up. Yeah. yeah. Let me just get a screen. Yes, and so baguettes were. were were came up with because of this desire for morning breads and it takes so long to bake a loaf of bread so that they they basically came up with making the bread long and skinny so that it bakes faster and and that in the morning because they cut down the size of the baguettes you bake quicker in the morning because the french wants some bread at yeah. And I, I told you about the, I told you guys about pumpernickel already. No, see. Well, no, no, we have pumpernickel is was is we have Napoleon to thank, in a way, um, and it's it's kind of a funny story. And I just learned this the other day from a French baker colleague of mine, and is that um, Napoleon had a, his favorite horse, 
and her name was Nicole. And uh, he, as they had, you know, conquered Germany or something like that, but it was, it was in Germany or Austria, he wanted bread for his horse, Nicole. So he said to them, pain, per Nicole. Pain, bread, per, for Nicole. Pain, per Nicole. Pain, per Nicole. That's where it came from. <laughs> it's, it's the absolute truth. The Germans thought he was saying, they couldn't understand what he said. So they just said, oh, bumper nickel. <laughs> yep. And that's the, the, the thing that this is, there's so, so much history here. So much history here, civilization. 6,000 years. Ago. Yeah. There's, there was actually, uh, I, I should try and find the article again sometime. And there was some archeologists who discovered uh, some 2000 year old bread in, uh, in the Middle East somewhere um, and like a recipe and stuff. And so they're, they were actually setting out to try and duplicate this 2000 year old bread using the same grains they used and things like that. But they actually found, you know, petrified piece of bread that had been preserved in, in the, the dirt or whatever, right? Um, it's, it's really interesting. But there's so many tidbits of, history pieces, uh, whether it be in the breads or in other things in, in baking and in food in general. Um, it, it's amazing how many of the stories in, uh, in bread and pastries I've been discovering that relate back to like Austria and Poland. Like we, we, I think we talked about the croissants earlier, how that was the devouring of the Turkish flag. And another one is the bagel, um, which is a, a round dough that is boiled, right? And that was an Austrian baker created that in honor of the Polish king visiting, who was a big fan of polo. And it was to represent the stirrup, the horse's stirrup, because he loves horses so much. And the stirrup in German is bügel. Um, so from bügel, it became bagel over the years, right? Um, and so it's just one of those things, right? It's just things you don't, uh, uh, these bits of information, yeah, my the iPad is just video. It's, uh, there's no cheat notes on there, right? Guys, if you want to try some of this, what do you want to do at this point? It's up to you guys. Yeah, it's already well past the appointed time. So, guys, if you want to take a little bit of Yeah, absolutely. Yep. If you guys want to be by yourself and uh, take a bit of this plan. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Any of them, help yourself. Yep. Yeah, feel free. Um, if anyone who's staying on the snow will take a little help from the pit and we'll pull them through that. But uh, I don't think there's much to do with the pit at all, Mark. No, just a few bowls. Thank you very much. I know it's not easy to do it to listen to for three hours, but you did a great job. Yep. Here's the cutting board. Why don't we? Chef Mark, that was fantastic. Thank you. That was really, really good. I love the uh, upper nickel story. I never knew that. Yeah, that's. I never knew that. My college colleague Richard, he posted that recently on Facebook. That's I just fantastic. thought, just awesome. So, uh, let's, so you've got in there. You do the math. So you've got that's hundred grams. Uh, that's 200 grams, right? 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 
Make sure you're getting. Uh, that's semolina. That's not bread flour. That's that's for making pasta. Okay. Uh, you have to ask chef where he has it because I haven't seen it either. Right. There's only pastry flour and, and semolina here, right? Chef. Thank you. That's the sourdough. Yep. No, that's semolina. That's Durham semolina. That's not bread flour. I can change the setting. I'll send you a text. Are you working tonight? Hmm? Are you working tomorrow? Bread flour. No. Oh, I said it was No, it should be bread flour. So you'll have to do a catch up like she did, right? He, when he's done, he, he said he has some. I don't know where it is, right? So, um, that doesn't look bad. You're lucky. You could you could try try it out. It should make a nice bread. But semolina is it's from wheat, but it's a very very hard type of wheat, and it won't have the same gluten formation that you need and for the final bread. Okay. Now, given that your sour is only a small percentage in the end of the dough, and that's just the starter, as long as what you continue to add is bread flour, that'll be fine. So we'll just have to wait until he's finished with her, um, because I don't know where the ingredients are. You did your homework. You only did that Friday through Friday. You did the readings before the weekend. Remember? Bread flour. There's no bread flour back there. Are we using the semolina? No bread flour. No. Who's here? Anyone want to run down and get the bread flour? Okay, it's downstairs. There should be three bags. Oh, okay. So that's that's where it was. I didn't. Yeah. I know you said you had some, but I didn't know it. That's durum semolina. Yeah. That's no, that's not bread flour. That's for making pasta. Oh. oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I take this. Yeah. Take it home for pasta. Yeah. For pasta or for um, for ada, ada flour for uh, Indian breads. Have you ever made pasta out of vegetables? Like out of vegetables? Oh, no, 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 no. Out of beans. Bean. Yeah, bean yeah, powders. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because our, the company I worked for, we we cooked beans and, and ground them. So we sold pre cooked powdered beans. So we, we were able to make some pastas from it. Oh, yeah. All purpose. Yeah, either all-purpose all -purpose or bread flour. Yeah, yeah all-purpose, all guys. Yeah, I yeah. know how this semolina starts. That's what you use? Yeah. Oh, no. No, it was bread flour and then all-purpose. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's in there. It's right. You got to read. Whole wheat would be okay. I always start mine with whole wheat. No, mm -hmm. if you read, if you, you read, you got to read these things beginning to end before, before you start any recipes. This is, I found a big problem here. You got to read the recipe twice. Okay. You don't touch anything okay. before you scale. Read the recipe twice. Get it done. It'll say in here the flowers to you, right? Okay. This is bread flour, but I can do all the but too, right? You get a pinch, you can. Yeah, yeah. but they're getting bread flour. They're getting bread flour. They're getting bread flour. So, yeah. But if you're just starting that tonight, if you started with the fish, you're going to have to redo it tonight with a 12 hour feed, right? Remember? Like we talked about earlier. Yeah. Oh, yeah.
No, 40 grams water, 40 grams flour. 40 grams flour. We're, get, we're getting tired. We've been here. <laughs> we had a busy weekend. <laughs> You could try it. It would be better if you start over. It really would. Right? Yeah. So just like what uh, she's having to do or what most of them are having to do. So you, you do it on a 12 hour refresh starting today. So you, you start it today, 12 hours from now, you refresh it. And 12 hours from that, you refresh it. And then you just continue with the normal schedule from there. Does it make sense to you? Yep. Thank you. Do we put it on a whiteboard for them or something? So I could have made it through it now, but it took a long time. You're making it in Pandora. Pandora, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 